right, all right, all right. I think we popping up live. Let me see. Wait till I see a video come up. All right. I see it. Yo, if you on the Zoom, make sure you mute your joint. Thank you. I'm gonna have to boot you. Stay muted or you getting booted. <laughs> if you in there, stay muted or you getting booted, all right? Yo, what's up, everybody? Of course, I am Wavy Wayne, and I'm sitting here with a legend today. I don't really got to do too much introduction. This is a man, a god, a king, a father, grandfather, an engineer, mixed engineer, photographer, a, a teacher, a student, man. Guru is so many things. I'm super excited, if you can't tell to have Guru here today. Uh, definitely somebody who's inspired me, uh, helped pave the journey for black engineers. You know, one thing that I see the most is that I look at Guru and at a time when I was getting engineering, it wasn't a lot of blacks doing it. It wasn't no black engineers to look up to. So you was one of the main and only people that I saw in the game that was like, yo, I can identify with you. So for one <laughs> i definitely appreciate you being that representation for us and so much more uh in the industry guru so definitely uh hats off to you bro that was a um that was an interesting time man it was like um i, I always give it to sort of doro right uh people don't know doro they should look him up doro sort of like jack robinson for me of uh engineering uh especially in new york city right uh and especially for like my age group so it was a tough thing back then of um it used to be this group called the allied pool um and, and great guys you know tony maserati was in it was a bunch of people uh but it was one of those things where you didn't see a lot of us you didn't really see the representation um you know across the board especially in new york so it was it was a dope thing just to like be one of those guys to help break that stereotype but i always you know it was it was more than just me it was, i always mentioned doro um yeah. that's what i kind of like not just pattern myself after, but I literally was like, who manages him? And that's who I went after. So it was a woman named L'Oreal uh, that, that really, like the first day I met her, I was like, okay, well, I know the SSL, I know the API, and I know the need. And you know, we had like maybe a 20, 30 minute conversation. And the next day I was in a session with DMX, <laughs> the next day. So it was just like, she was the one that was doing that. Doro was out there. You had uh, uh, Brian Stanley, you had Pat Fiala, uh, you know, all of those guys are my guys that were just like, between us, that's that's pretty much, you know, all of the Neptunes, all of Murder, Inc., all of Rockefeller. Uh, Doro was the like head guy that I used to see do, and I don't want to say his numbers, but like, you know, do two mixes in a day, getting, you know, five grand a mix, pulling up to the studio in a Porsche. Yeah. And it's like, okay, like I got, <laughs> I gotta, I gotta be where he's at. So yeah. that was the, you know, that was the vibe and that was the time. And, and that was a real concerted effort of like, we gotta break through this door. Yo, man, I'm, and I'm glad you said that, like about the engineer flexing, because, uh, you know, of course he, he doing his thing. And, and when you doing your thing, you deserve a little, you know, some some gems. You deserve a little uh, a Porsche to pull up into the studio with. So um, I'm, I'm glad to see that spot and, and see that engineers getting a spotlight and getting the, the respect in the, the payment and treatment that they deserve, man. Uh, that's dope. Uh, one thing I noticed a lot about you when you talk is that you mentioned and give credit to a lot of people uh, along the way. Like just just now, since we started, you probably yeah. mentioned at least five names, you know? Um, yeah. And that's something kind of studying you in your, your career that I've noticed is that it seems like a lot of what your success has been directly attributed to relationships that you are able oh, to uh, cultivate and build and keep on building with people. Um, even from like the time you were in uh, Howard, right? I'm like, so like, can you, can you kind of, I want to paint a picture of how your career grew and through the, through those relationships. So can we kind of start at that point? And, and so we can kind of pinpoint how one relationship connected to the other one and got you where you at today. Yeah. Well, how it was just monumental because one, um, my focus was music because I gave up basketball to go to Howard. Mm -hmm. So it was a conscious decision. I think sometimes people don't make these like conscious decisions in their life. And for me, it was out of necessity because I had all these basketball scholarships and I was sitting with my parents and like, again, this is, I had the most incredible parents, still do have the most incredible parents in the world. who We discussed everything and we talked about everything and they know everything that's going on. So it was a real like, are we taking these basketball scholarships or not? And I'm like, no, nah, I want to take my shot at this music. Mm. Um, that was a real thing. I went to Howard like specifically because my cousin went there and then I just felt like that, there's no energy like Howard. 
So when I went there, before I even did my room, like my mom and my uncle was putting my room together. I just walked straight to the student radio station. It's just like, I need a show, right? Cause I'm a <laughs> DJ or whatever. But yeah. it was just that hunger or, or focus of knowing what I wanted to do. The relationship parts come in where I get with my crew. So this is another point where people are always like, well, how do I get with the big artists? And I'm just like, well, sometimes you gotta make the artists or grow with them, you know, Thanks. sort of thing. So uh, Tracy Lee, who was probably the lead or biggest person out of our crew, he ended up having a single called his party time. Um, he was like, you know, number one on, on, on BT and all this other stuff like in 97. I met him when I first got to school. So that's my crew. That's who we're coming up. We're trying to make records, same thing, you know, I had been in the studio and know how to engineer um, hip hop, but I, I had never went to school for it at that point. So this is the normal thing of us making beats, us throwing parties, saving up money. Like I had so many parties during the week that I could devote one day and say a Saturday was to the crew. So we would throw parties. I would take like 50 bucks off the party or whatever, no regular DJ fee because it's for the crew. Back then you could not record at home. So there was no computers, you know, in, in at home recording. We had a four track, a task in four track that we would try ideas on. Cause we had like one room that was set up with an SP, uh, SP 1200 um, and a rolling sample. I can't remember what the sample was, but my man's father gave it to us. Um, but if that was sort of like our 950 or whatever it was for longer samples. Yeah. Um, and in another room we had just an SP, but we would sit there, come up with ideas. We had three different groups. One called One Step Beyond, Tracy Lee was one, and The Reeks was another group. It was a group out of the Bronx. Um, so that was a three-man group. So in going to Howard, I meet Derek Angeletti, who becomes like my OG. If you if, For those that don't know, Derek Angeletti was part of the Hitman, part of Puff Squad. Mm -hmm. So if I get to school in 92, Bad Boy doesn't start till 95, right? Right. So Derek and Ron were already two kings in a cypher. And they already had a video on BET and like the whole thing, but they were producers. So this is around the time when I'm getting there and I'm meeting them. I also meet Chucky Thompson, who is probably the most important relationship I've ever had in my life, right? Mm -hmm. Rest in peace to Chucky Thompson. So this is dead off the heels of him doing like um, a bunch of big R&B records um, and just about to get to the Mary J. Blige My Life album, which is like the life changing album for him. Yeah. Um, those relationships are already being formed and being established, but it wasn't from a standpoint of giving me a job, it was just those were my OGs. Mm -hmm. So if Puffy is throwing a party, I'm literally outside with my hand up, like, yo, Derek, we're out here, get us in. You know, I'm not talking to Puff to get us in, I'm talking to Derek to get us in. Right. So those are the relationships I started. Derek would allow us to come when he's working on whatever um, in the studio and just watch him and be around him and see how it went. So that was the beginning of the relationships and everybody at Howard was like that. If, if, if Man, it, it, everybody just helped everybody. It yeah. was just one of those things that I would say, okay, I could write my paper, but my punctuation and spelling is bad. So I would give it to this girl and say, hey, can you type my paper correctly? I'll let you in the party for free on the weekend or you can get in for a month or whatever. That's how we used our different relationships to get stuff done. Mm -hmm. And my crew was about like, we did everything at the given time. When I say everything, meaning we made the music, we mixed the music, we had MCs, we had DJs, we had graffiti artists, we had a guy that was making clothing, we had like the whole thing. And we would help each other just do whatever we needed to do. That was the the yeah. huge relationships. Um, we started this thing, well, I didn't start it, but there was a hip hop conference going on at Howard. And that's where I met my first manager. He was, he was involved with the hip hop conference. So I got into it the first year, won the DJ competition. Um, and that just created by, by volunteering for this hip hop conference and being a part of what's called culture initiative that threw the conference on the campus. Now I work for them and they're going to me, Hey Google, you got a car, go pick up the lost boys from the airport and bring them, you know, to campus, go pick up so-and-so from, and I'm starting to meet artists, you know what I mean? In a different yeah. situation and, and, and just getting to know people. So all of those connections just really mean something. And, and besides the fact that I'm DJing, and by the time it hit 93, I already had all my clubs on lock. Like I'm, I'm literally doing uh, from Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, I had my own spots. Monday, I might be at the Ibex for like a go-go night. You know, like Tuesday and Wednesday, I might chill and then it starts all over. So through, through that DJing, um, just the relationship that you get at Howard, yep. that's where it really, really spawns. And, you know, I get um, with Nonchalant in 96. Yep. So I auditioned for her. 
because she needed a DJ. But the way I got that was through another DJ. So I'm with LS1, who's like my big brother, like my OG, the dude I trained with, who I would go into battles. I would practice with DJ Supreme, who, you know, who won a title, and DJ LS1. These were my two people. LS1 ended up DJing for Onyx and then most famously DJing for DMX. For sure. So that was my training ground. So I'm standing outside of a Rat Pages conference back when there used to be Rat Pages. They used to have like a newspaper. Um, almost like like a source or a vibe or XXL, but it was an actual newspaper called Rat Pages. They had a conference. So I'm sitting outside smoking and me and LS1 is out there and then this dude walks up and is like, LS, I need a DJ for my girl. You know what I mean? She, she just got signed to MCA, blah, blah, blah. And LS was like, yo, my man is dumb next. So I just auditioned for her. And a week later, I'm, I'm in Florida with her performing and that show, we ended up opening for the Fugees. Mm. So when, when we get there and it's just like, I look at the Fuji camp, I'm like, this is all my family from, from Jersey. Yeah. Like Leon, Leon is DJing for them. Like you gotta remember the the, uh, the Fuji's is from, um, well, Clef and them is from like around my way in Irvington. Okay. And then Lauren, you know what I'm saying? I know her whole side and like her brother and her mother's a very famous teacher and I'm North, you know what I mean? On my side, my family's North. Mm. So it was just like, wow, I know everybody in this. And they was just like, yo, Y'all want to come on our European leg and open up for us? This is the Ready or Not tour. This is mm. this is the first time I need a passport. This is like, <laughs> they like, do y'all want to open up for us? I'm right. like, hell yeah, we want to open up for y'all. So the whole three months of the European Ready or Not tour, Nonchalant is the opening act for the Fuji, and I'm on that tour. Gotcha. So this is my first time, like I said, needing a passport. But again, building these relationships, going first time going out of the country for music and seeing okay, this could actually be a viable, like, it's, it's no longer just a dream. Like, I'm actually touching it. I'm actually doing it. I'm actually, you know, and, and not a, um, a spot date, should I say. Like, we've all done spot dates. Like, oh, I'm performing in my city. I go there, I argue with the sound man. He don't really care because it's hip-hop. Da, da, da. No, this is a proper tour where I'm on a bus. The bus drives into the venue. Yeah. Like, the Fuji's were so nice to be like, y'all could take as long as y'all want for sound check. This is my first time where somebody, the engineer, even cares to, like, have a computerized EQ that has my name on it. You know, like, mm. though that, like, the professionalism of that tour was just shocking to me coming from the struggle bars of, my group coming in, trying to explain to a live engineer that I actually know what I'm talking about when I hear stuff and I'm calling out frequencies like, yo, could you dip like 60 hertz out of this? And could you, dip? you know, I mean, it's probably going to be a problem frequency at like 3.5, I think. I think. And, and then he's looking at me like, oh, OK, he kind of knows what he's talking about. So it was that struggle at first because I'm black and because we're young and people don't think that I know what I'm talking about. I know we talk about relationships, but yeah, even, yeah. even learning how to deal with those situations mm -hmm. is a bonus. Because a lot of times when I would first start out in New York, I, people would walk into the session and they'd be like, you're the engineer? And I'd be like, yeah. And they, you know, they were like, they, they expect to see some long haired, right. you know what I'm saying? Like rock and roll dude that's like, a lot of those engineers were like rock and roll guys who were kind of mad that hip hop was taking over, but they still had to work. Mm -hmm. in the late 80s and early 90s. So it's like, they don't really like the music. They don't really like the crew. They don't understand the culture. They don't. So right. it was like, let alone you understanding how to mix an 808 or a kick or something <laughs> you know, like those yeah. things. So those things were lessons for me in terms of how to conduct myself. Um, and I had really good, Chucky was the best mentor in terms of relationships because he was the first one that really, really sat me down and was like, dude, look, we don't get checks on Friday. Hmm. This is how this is going to work. I'm going to make sure that you're going to get this money. But if I get you a project and you mix this thing and you get $20,000, what are you going to do with that? Because hmm. it's not guaranteed that you're going to get another 20 for have a look. I'm going to try to get you this, this, and this. But if I get you 50, right. then take half of that, pay your bills. Now take half of that 25, set that to the side. Now you can play with like 10% of this. Yeah. Go mess this, this part up. But somebody's showing you how to structure your life like that when you've never been told how to save money for taxes. You've never been told like, okay, this is the first time where he's like, ooh, nah, we just had dinner. You know that receipt, can, we talked about business. Yeah. That receipt for this dinner can go towards your taxes. So he was the first one to really explain to me the game besides just mm. I'm trying to get on and get hot. He was just like, this is the actual fact of how we move in this so that you're not broke. 
that was the that was the biggest thing with relationships. Chucky was just so good at being a, a huge mentor. That's dope. It seemed like he was definitely there more more than the music, but you know, teaching you life skills and, and stuff like that. Which is so important in what we do because you know, you you may not get a chance to even practice your craft if your life is messed up. You know, mm. I, I wish I was one of those people that was like, hey, I'm 20 something and I want to go engineer and I'm moving to at 22 years old, I had a kid. Yeah. And from that point on, life is serious. From that point on, I can never be broke. From that point mm. on, eating the oodles and noodles to survive is over. Like now I have to go produce, which is a, a it was just this really dope thing that you put up um, the other day where you were being real and you said, hey, for those of you that don't live in one of these major places, you may have to get up and go to where the music is. And I put, yeah. I had to do it twice. Yeah. You know, like I had to do it twice and make these decisions on, you know, eventually I moved to New York and it's just like, okay, I got to get up and go. And and the second move wasn't even out of necessity. It was because I felt too comfortable. I felt too comfortable in DC. Everything was just working perfect, but I was just coasting and not rising. You know what I mean? And yeah. that was, so I had to make that decision. Yeah, it was kind of like you were you were kind of hitting the the top of the peak uh, in DC, and it wasn't really too much more for you to do. So, you know, exactly. to keep growing, you had to get in a, a bigger pool. You know, yeah, or, and I, want, I always want to test your metal against like the big. You know, I'm I'm never scared to. I'm from Wilmington, Delaware, so my whole life is me going to cities that's bigger than where I'm from. So yeah. I was never scared, whether or not that's going to Philly to play basketball or going. I always want to test myself against people everywhere, so I know you know I'm in the right pool of talent. Or it up, man. They say you to stay sharp, you know that, and I feel like that's something that you constantly do is is kind of keep learning and keep evolving. Oh. And I know like a big part of that is by keep on placing yourself at the bottom of situations. Like when you feel like you're in the top, then okay, maybe let me jump off into a, a different market or dump off into a different genre to where I'm not at the top. So that forces me to learn new skills and keep you know developing new processes of thinking and, and stuff like that. Uh -huh. It was a different way of looking at things. Like to, to build off the point, I hope the audience understand. I'm gonna jump around a little bit just, For just sure. to make points. But the point you just made is, and you called me a student, and, and that's one of my mantras. Like I'm forever a student. I'm yeah. forever learning. I'm forever because what I saw first was, and this was late '99, right? Um, we're still on tape. The majority of New York City is still recording on tape. There are Pro Tools systems in studios, but it wasn't the norm to just walk in, turn on the Pro Tools, and just go. People were still using tape, and then some people were like transferring to Pro Tools later or whatever, right? But yep. a lot of engineers, when Pro Tools first came out, they they was like, "Oh, it sounds horrible. It's just, what is this? A 16 bit, and it's it doesn't sound." The same. And I was just like, "If y'all can't see that this is the future." And a lot of people just dissed it and were, and was dismissive of it. Yeah. So I literally like had the same story as everybody else. I, I'm working, but all my friends who are musicians, who are other engineers, or whatever, they do the normal thing. Half of them work at Guitar Center. Half of them work at Sam Ash. Half mm -hmm. of them work at. So I knew all the people that worked at those places. So I would just go there on the regular and just check my dudes. And they had a DVD in there of like learn Pro Tools. Okay. So. And, and back then it was like, I'm not buying this. This was like 50 bucks back then. And I was like, nah. So I put the DVD in and I started taking notes like inside of the store on like how to work. <laughs> yeah. And I saw it as a future and I'm like saying to the engineers, I'm well, I deal with computers. So everything about a computer always gets faster, smaller and better. This is the first iteration of it, you know, mm -hmm. and it was clunky and it wasn't a lot of plugins and it wasn't the way it is now. Hmm. Right where we have all all the plethora of stuff we have now. I'm just saying that to say, yeah. me being that student is what got me in a lot of rooms because people were like, "Well, we need a Pro Tools operator," and I was charging people literally seventy five dollars an hour to press the Apple key in the space bar, hmm. and it was like because people didn't understand Pro Tools or it, it, impressing people. Yeah, you know, I, I famously say this. I had a session with Eric Sermon early, like during that time. And you know, the setup would be come in, you got your beat machine, you got your keyboard, you got your racks of whatever. Back then it was like the 1080 or the 2080, the Triton, the Trent, everything, right? Yep. So the producer comes in, loads everything up, presses play, and you will record that for six minutes onto a reel because you don't know how long the song is going to be. So you would just give yourself six minutes. On a reel, it was 15 minutes on a reel. So you could probably get off like, you know what I'm saying? If, if you did, three five minute joints or if you did two six minute joints you know what i mean that's basically yeah. what you would have on a reel 
and you don't know exactly like there's no thing of I know exactly how many MCs is going to be is you don't know yeah. so you were recorded for like six minutes so long story short Eric Sermon sets everything up I record the first like eight bars and then there was a like a four bar or difference and then there's an eight bar hook and I stopped it and he's like yo what you doing I'm like that's all that's all I need and he's like what do you mean and then he watched me just like edit and loop it down he's like you could do that like and i was just like <laughs> yeah it was early but i'm saying that to say don't ever stop learning yes and it also affects me now like i had a certain way of the way that i mix or the way that i would have my session set up and then if i'm going in to deal with like say me and Stu is sharing a space right because he's dealing with beyonce i'm dealing with jay-z we kind of in the same space or we have to bounce sessions in between each other and Stu works completely opposite than the way I work. I'm a simplify everything person. It took me a long time to even think about making templates and things of that nature. Cause I was like, nah, I don't want to do the same thing over and over and over. Mm -hmm. I used to like, right. But out at engineers that I saw in the analog world that was like, no, I have my outboard gear set and that's the way it is. And I don't change it. And they would rearrange tracks. They had like had certain stuff inserted on certain channels and they would rearrange tracks to make that guitar go through channel nine. Mm -hmm. Right? Just just because that was my guitar. And they would never and I was like, how can you do that for every song? Every song is different. Like, yeah, you gotta me, I gotta change things because everything, but it's like I kind of got into this thing of, of hating templates or the idea of it. And then okay. when I started working with Stu or having to share sessions with him, I'm like, I get it. I get why he has all this stuff set up already. Because when B's flowing, he don't have time to be like, let me make another track. Let me do this. You know? So he has the track set up from A to Z, anything possible that he could possibly do. He already has like stutter edit and the track ready. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. every possible thing that you could think of to do, he has it ready, it's just disabled. Right. So it's like that, that cluttered my mind. Or like Stu works with all the colors on, I hate the colors on. <laughs> The, the front page so i was like all right let me and i'm saying in the last three years i've completely changed the way that i think about it and I, I dove in and was like instead of me fighting this let me sit there and watch jason joshua mix so i can it's not that i'm trying to bite his style right. i'm looking at how do you do stuff different from me and what can i pull from that that will make me better faster or just give me a different take on the way that i do things and i started developing certain things that um you know are different from the way that i used to do things but i feel like speed me up and, and it's always that i'm learning and learning and learn. i just take things i look at it and if, if it's not for me it's not for me but i adapt and, and update what i'm doing and that's part of the always learning process besides the fact that now we have a point where we getting plugins every week and it's just like <laughs> you know yeah. these small and i love it these small boutique companies that are like three and four people yeah. that are, hey i built this thing and we're putting it out into the marketplace and we're not you know we're not waves and we're not universal audio and we're not these big companies but we do have a good product is like i want to learn those those specific plugins too and, and i'm still one of those guys that like i'll try messing with it for like five ten minutes but then i love reading the manual i know a lot of people say don't read the manual you'll be way more creative but I love reading the manual. I like knowing what's going on. There's things that I design when I'm designing things that are under the hood that you won't know. About, and I need to know what's going on under the hood or what the person thought about so that if I want to use it in a way that they didn't intend, I know what's going on. So mm -hmm. I, I, I know that's a thing. A lot of people are like, I don't read manuals. It makes you less creative. I'm like, I love reading. Manuals. No, I think you could definitely be more creative by reading the manual. Because like you said, once you understand the mechanics under the hood, then you can use it how you want to or do it, use it how it's not necessarily intended because you at least know, you know what I'm saying, what's going on. I love that that fact that you keep growing and keep expanding your knowledge and you're open to changing because, you know, a lot of um, veteran engineers, they are completely stuck in their ways and, and they shoot down a lot of new ideas. You know, there's no way I'll ever do that. That's that's terrible, you know. Uh, pro, there's no way anal the digital is going to ever sound better than, you know, analog, right? And and they hold on to a lot of things. So, um, but while we on that topic, I do want to, I had a question that I wanted to ask you about that. Like, but let, we can jump into that a little bit now. Like, how do you feel, um, how, how's that transition happened for you? Has it been easy for you kind of transitioning from working primarily analog to, 
going digital, I see that you was already on the forefront of it and you was embracing it from the jump. But like, what's your workflow like now, I guess is more, are you completely in the box? Um, in, in a way, in a way. So I'm not completely in the box and I don't want to lie to people. I fell in love with the Shadow Hills um, summing. Like the Shadow Hills is just, it's like, I can't explain to you how good this summon amp is. And okay. I, I won't name the other companies, but what I did was <laughs> I was lucky enough that um, the guys over at uh, uh, over at uh, uh, Vintage, over at- um, Vintage um, King? Vintage King, Okay. right? They did me a favor and I was over at No ID Studio. This is back in the time when we was working on like a um, Commons album um, that No ID produced. And I said to them to, I said, bring me every summon amp and I want to do a shootout with all of them. And I did that. I just ran a song that I knew through its stems and the Shadow Hills one just killed everything. And it's the fact that you have this selection of the three different type of transistors yeah. that give you, you know, if, if it's all the way up, it's going to give you a, a bump in sort of the highs. If it's in the middle, it gives you a little bit more of a bump in the mids and makes it a little bit stronger. And if it's on the last one, it just it just goes crazy on the lower, you know. Mm. But it's 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 not a set. It's not a set and leave thing. It's like a taste. So some songs, I'm, I'm all over the place, but that sort of thing of going into my um, my Shadow Hills Equinox is my summing amp. But I'm, I'm pretty much in the box while I'm doing the mix, and mm -hmm. then I'll separate into stems going into my Shadow Hills, and then I go back into uh, into into Pro Tools. Okay, okay. Dope, dope, man. And so uh, you find yourself doing that's like all the time. That's your that's your workflow is in the box most, straight most, through the. Well, let's let's say I'm here. Let's say I'm here and, and I want to do a mix. You know, while I'm here in North Carolina at the Jamble Studio, then I don't have my shadow hills, and I'm completely in the box, and I'm completely comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. So the way my sessions are sort of set up at the end, you know, those things can easily be split out. So I'm I'm eventually going to have, you know, kind of I don't want to say the same thing everybody else does, but my stems at the end. Everything's going to be driven to something that says drums, you know what I'm saying, main music, vocals, effects. Okay. You know what I mean? And sometimes the effects are coming into the vocal. Like sometimes I'll have the vocal effects on, in that vocal thing, and sometimes I have just the music effects in the, whatever they're related to. So the drum effects will be with the drums and all that. So I can easily spit those out and then sum them back. And if I'm not in an analog world, you know what I mean? All of that is just eventually getting summed to, you know, a two channels inside of folks. Dope, dope, man. So I kind of want to circle back a little bit because I'm I'm definitely inspired by your story and how you kind of knew that you wanted to pursue a career in music in some kind of way. And you actually had a lot of opportunities on the table for basketball and you yeah. walked away from that to go to, to Howard. Um, like what was your, your what sparked you to want to do that? Like what was inside of you that, that said, look, I know this music thing is going to be bigger than basketball for me, even though like the outside world was probably looking at you and saying like basketball is going to be the biggest thing for you. Right. Um, it's very simple. Music was my passion. Basketball was, was cool. It was like, I'm good at the game. I like it. I can play it really well. I'm really smart at it. But it wasn't my passion to go to the NBA. I know that's the people's passion in the hood, but it wasn't my passion. And I got into the business of basketball, meaning I went on my NCAA trips and I was like, oh, this is a business. And I was just like, okay, I get it now. I get why people get frustrated. And I was lower, I, I was lower division one, like division two. So I was like, I could imagine what like super high division one dudes go to because it was just crazy going on all my trips. And I was like, I don't want to do this as a profession. Yeah. And I don't want to do this in school because then I won't be able to DJ parties. So yeah. it, it's simple. Music was my love, my passion. It's, it's that simple question of if, if you had all the money in the world, what would you get up and do everything? You know, and, and then once you answer that question, you figure out how to get paid for that thing. And then that way you'll never, you know what I mean? You'll be happy your whole life because you never really worked. So I didn't know it was going to be bigger than basketball, but I was like, I'm the type of person that I'm going to make it be bigger than that. There's no way I'm going to lose. It's Loss is impossible. Mm -hmm. Like if you get knocked down, it's just, you just haven't made it there yet. But my mentality is always like, it's impossible for me to lose. It's impossible for me not to get to where I want to go. And that was the, just the mentality because I'm just like, uh, it's not it's not the I'm better than everybody else thing, it's that I, I'm willing to outwork them. Yeah. Chucky is a way better musician than Derek Angeletti, but Derek will outwork him every day. He's a, he's, as a, as a producer, mm -hmm. Derek will outwork him. He's gonna stay up longer than you. He's gonna cross every T, dot every I. He's not like, 
he just isn't leaving until it's perfect. He's also the person that can direct and and direct a session, which is a whole other you know talent in and of itself. So I'm around those type of people. That's just like you, it, there is no no. That's mm. the Howard mentality. There is no failure. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Ain't no way I can lose, man. <laughs> we ain't done yet. If it, if it looked like I lost, it's because it, it ain't done yet, you know? I just didn't get there. Or it's a lesson. Or it's thought, you know, I got to figure out what did I do wrong. And that, that comes with a lot of honest critique. People sometimes, uh, uh, Common has a line where he says, you need to do more deleting and less saving. You know, like, mm. you need to critique yourself. You need to critique yourself. Like, how good is this? It's yesterday, uh, Ruben Vincent, right? The, the, the guy that I'm working with now that he signed to Jamler that signed a Live Nation. Um, he does a freestyle yesterday in the studio. I was like, it's good, it's cool, but I think you could do better. You know what I'm saying? Like, anybody else would have been like, yo, yeah, yeah, put that out. But I'm like, nah, like, let's get, let's do great. Where's great at? You know what I mean? Until we get great, not good is not good enough. Hmm. I like that. Do, do more deleting and less saving, man, and, and really get get critical with yourself and I, that's one thing that I I like to stress you know to my students and people that learn from me when they asking questions about recording and mixing you know if they how did I know if my mix is good enough like well you know what songs you like on the radio you know like line, put them next to each other and see like what's what's lacking on yours and be be honest like is it am, are you hitting the marks that you that of stuff that you love and if you're not then you know get back in the lab get back in into the books and figure out you know what's the disconnect here right um so definitely was, um while you while you're touching on that what's good now is that we have these um dope plugins i use uh what is it Met metric ab is okay. something that comes with the, the plugin alliance joint yeah um and i'm i'm consider that used to be a big thing for me of uh, even when I was on um, analog, that I would have a copy of the rough, and I would always be just jumping between my mix and hitting solo on those two channels to be like, am I going too far away from? Because the, what happens is people make a song, and there's a vibe in the room on that day. Yeah. And when somebody's like, even even in your MPC or now you know in your in your DAW, you're actually mixing when you're creating because you're like leveling things off. You may not be adding a ton of effects, or you may not be carving the way we are when we're doing a final mix right. but the producer himself or the tracking engineer is setting levels you know like just easily even if somebody's just doing it in foodie loops you know what I'm you're setting levels so even when you give me the two track there's a vibe that you like when you create it on that day and i can't lose that vibe i'm trying to enhance that vibe but not lose it right. so i'm constantly back and forth with the rough and with the, the now that's one thing that like say Jason Joshua does, doesn't do that I do a lot. He's like, oh, I'm a I'm a whiz kid, and I can just listen to the song one time, and I remember. No, not good. I'm constantly <laughs> back and forth, back and forth, making sure I'm giving my client like because the client has listened to this for months. They wrote around to it. They've created it. They've now got to the point where they say it's good enough for me to spend the money, the money that we're asking them to pay us to mix this song. They've identified it as something they want to put out. They're married to it. We This is our first time hearing it when we get it. You know, like, yeah. so it's just like, you got to really make sure you're not taking away from the vibe of what they're doing. So sometimes there is no right or wrong. There are right or wrongs in terms of like, yo, these things are clashing or these vocals are dull or they're too bright or there's too much essence or whatever. But I'm saying in terms of like, one or two difference in the decibel of where I put an instrument can make a big difference in the feel. And I don't want to lose the feel of what they did that first day. So that's an important thing of always referencing the reference song. Okay. Yeah, man. I, I, I definitely want to, I want to dive a little bit deeper into that point, but uh, I do want to shout out to everybody that's in the live chat on YouTube right now, man. I see y'all going ham. I see y'all uh, buying badges and all that and, and hitting that share button, man. We got young guru. This is legendary today. Um, so I, I appreciate everybody that's tapping in. We're going to open up to a Q&A in a little bit. So make sure that if y'all got questions for Guru, y'all drop them off into the chat. Um, so Guru, back to you, though. I want to mm -hmm. uh, you um, the the A, B and thing. So like the metric A, B or whatever you use. I use a Isotope um, plug in. They got an ozone. It has a reference feature where you can load up a reference in there and A, B it while you in the mix. So I mm -hmm. like. You know, I like that one, but it, honestly, that's the the whole idea is that making sure that you testing your your mix against either that rough mix or even some other industry recognized mix that's close enough to the to the song that you're working on. And one of the one of the key factors, key factor, I got to keep telling people: make sure you hit that match button hmm. because volume of where you're listening to the rough and listening to your mix makes a big difference. When I'm starting out. 
that my mix is way lower than it's going to eventually be. I mix very low. Yeah. And so when I say low, like I'm nowhere near peaking. I leave myself a lot of headroom, right? Okay. Um, I like to, to monitor things with like BU meters because of the fact that I'm, I'm so used to BU meters and it gives me so much space, especially now all of us, no matter what, should be working in 32-bit flow. Like mm. if I don't care, like the, on, on the recording end, the 32-bit flow is not going to help. Right? It right. does, it does, it does help you a little bit, right? But let's 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 really remember what we're doing. This is one of the hardest things for me to explain to my students. Okay. Bit depth is not gonna give you more accuracy. What it does is it lowers the floor noise, which in essence gives you more dynamic range. Right. That's what bit depth is doing. If you want more, more accuracy of how many times you're taking the picture, that's that's you bumping from 44 to 48 to 90. You know what I'm saying? So right. me personally, right now, I work at 3248, right? So I even I love 3244 as well, but I work at 3248. But the reason I'm saying all of us should be working at 32 is when we mix in what it does for your plugins is the big key. That's the big key. When you start loading up five, six, seven, you know what I'm saying? You maxed out all the plugins on there. That's when you need the 32 bit and, and the way that it works is so much better um, than we were back in just the regular 16. That that extra headroom is everything. It's like every, every, every. It's a, it's a huge point that I think people misconstrue what bit depth really is. Okay. Yeah. So, cause definitely to me, I hadn't started using 32 bit floating point. Yeah. I'm, all, I'm still uh, 2448. Mm -hmm. um, so, that's why I was like, um, what what it, exactly is the additional benefits to to going thirty two? You of course you got okay. additional headroom, but like, what else? You know, the processing the processing power of all your plugins after now you've recorded everything, you're going to throw a whole bunch of plugins on there. What the thirty two bit does is allow you number one that the plugins don't have to do a, a conversion, mm -hmm. right? They're they're not converting this bit depth of audio, which which Pro Tools, and I don't want to just keep saying Pro Tools, right? Right. I love, I, I, I am an Ableton, just, I love Ableton. Ableton okay. is my favorite doll of all time. I know everybody has the doll wars, and they <laughs> want to see which one sounds better, which one doesn't. For creation, there's nothing better for me than Ableton, is the way that I think. Mm -hmm. There's nothing, like, all of my guys, everybody else here in Jamla, they use machines to create. You know, that is just, Ableton is what I have fallen in love with. I mix in Pro Tools. So the re I'm answering your question too about the 32 bit. So mm -hmm. once you start throwing a whole, like all of us do now, throw a million different plugins on, if you have a 16 bit or a 24 bit audio file and it's going into that plugin, then it's gotta do this conversion, then it's going to the next one, then it's going to the next one, then it's going to the next one. If it's already 32 bit, there's no conversion that goes in. So all the plugins are gonna work better and you're gonna not get these little artifacts that come about mm -hmm. because of the fact that you that when you're Okay, this is the whole reason that Dither was created, right? This is the whole reason that Dither, and I hope, I'm trying to just explain this as fast as possible. No, take your time. Take your time. If, if, if I only have, you know, a certain amount of spaces that I can set as to where this is, that is our bit depth. I think in like 16, or I don't want to say the wrong number, but it's like maybe like 40,000 places that you could put something that sounds like a lot, but it's not. Right. So, when we, especially when we talk about music. So if it's in between one of those things, the computer has to estimate based off of where the last one was, where the next one is, it kind of guesses, right? right. So that it can be wrong. So what we would do is there'll be errors in there. And what dithering does is that you would enter in a certain amount of noise, right? I.e. white noise, or, or all frequencies. So it would smooth out sort of the way that it would do that. And, and it's pleasing to people's ears, right? Like now, nowadays in a lot of our mixes, whether or not, um, somebody has it or not, I'll just take the, um, oh shoot, I, I, I'm the worst at, at, my memory is the worst. Um, I'll just take a plug in like the, uh, like say RC20, right? That could, that can literally just give us vinyl noise. Mm. And I'll just have that really low in the background. That acts as my dither. Okay. That's, that's it's like dithering the whole set, especially if there's times where th there's a dropout and there's no music or, you know what I'm saying? And it's right. like that, or it sounds a little weird in the digital domain when there's nothing. You know, like if you go from the sound to nothing to me, to my ears, it sounds weird. Yeah. So the dither yeah. kind of like helps it. That's that's what that is for me. But I'm saying all that to explain our bit depth and why you get an advantage when you work in 32 flow. Okay. I see that. So um 
Oh, what I kind of want to, I'm about to start working the 32 bit float, float point for sure. Um, I kind of want to go to that mix uh, question. So when you starting off a client's mix, somebody send you a mix that you didn't record. Um, do you just kind of pick up where the recording engineer left off in terms of whatever plugins and organization that they have in their session? Or do you like to um, like start from zero and like kind of reset mm -hmm. everything? It's a, it's a hybrid of both. So I literally go through every channel myself. I don't have an assistant do it. No assistant sets up my mixes. I set up my mixes because everything is different. So I literally go through the channel. Now, again, if there's like 10 tracks of background vocal and they all have the exact same plugins on it, obviously they're probably kind of doing the same thing. So I'll listen, I'll, I'll disable everything and see what stuff was important and what's necessary. So let's say the person just has an EQ, just the basic Pro Tools EQ, the seven, to roll off some low end and do some other stuff. I may replace that with my Pro Q3. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm gonna get okay. into my Pro, but if they have obviously auto tune or something that's like say an, a, a texture effect that really is there for the, like it makes the record, I'm not gonna try to recreate that. That's, that's part of what they did. Yeah. So it just depends on what it is. I take off the things that I feel like I can replace with my own things better, but then I leave the things on that I feel are like fundamental to the tone and, and sort of uh, texture of the song itself. So it just depends. Like there could be specific delays or something like that, that I feel like why recreate that the person, that's the way that they want it to be. Sometimes when I go into people's sessions and turn everything off, it sounds way better. Yeah. <laughs> way, 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 way better. And I'm like, okay, this sounds better just by me turning off plugins. You know, so it's just, it just yeah. depends on what it is. But I set up my sessions um, based off of like, whatever this person did, I'm trying to see if it messed it up or if it made it better. That's that's all I'm doing. And then I'll make a decision based off that. So I'll get the session, immediately do a, a save as whatever the name of the session is and just put Guru at the end, right? Before I even start rearranging like the way that I want it to look. I play it down, I get a feel for what they're trying to do. I listen to the rough, but then I'm kind of looking at their session and learning what they did. Um, if somebody has, a, like Stu is great for this. Like Stu will have so much extra shit <laughs> in the session that only he understands and knows about or if he has like tracks that are affecting other tracks and also I, I simplify all of that for me i take out all of that and start from is my game staging correct i always start with like what is the game staging in this somebody like either recorded too loud too low too whatever it is i get my game staging correct not only just for the session but especially for for plugins yeah. plugins all the plugins are designed to work at minus 18 because they are emulating hardware. Oh. So people need to understand that, that you can, yes, you can go louder than that, but the internal structure, the ones that don't work at an internal structure of minus 18, they tell you. There are certain okay. UA, you know what I mean? Because of the fact that they're trying to emulate the actual physical gear. So there's certain UA stuff that if it doesn't work at that, they're gonna tell you. Certain, most of the wave stuff works at that or else they tell you. Right, or it, in the it, manual, it, right, that, that we don't yes, read. in the manual, yes, yeah, yeah, <laughs> it tells you that it's designed because because when you're sitting there and you're going to even have a discussion about pushing harder, there has to be a point that we're saying is the normal point. You know, right. you, so to even have that concept of like, okay, we like when we overdrive this, well, what's the normal before we say overdrive? Hmm. So, you know, all your LA two ways, all your, you know, everything that you're seeing, seeing 1176, everything, they have these sweet points because they've been designed to emulate hardware. And especially for me, if I'm thinking about going outside of Pro Tools and inserting something on a track, like which I love to do just for character. So, I, you know, I have my 500 um, boxes okay. that have all the classic, you know, I got two API preamps. I have two of the EMI preamps. I have two needs. I have two, you know, just down the line of mm -hmm. some I have more than others, but I like the 500 series because it just sits comfortably in my, in my desk. Yeah. Um, and I'll insert, I'll come out of, let's say, take the, the drums and come out of whatever two channels that is, go into my APIs, because I love APIs on drums, and it's literally set at zero. And but it just gives a real feel that wasn't there before and come straight back in. Sometimes I bump it up or not, but it's not really there for like volume control. It's just there to get the harmonics and the saturation of actually running through analog gear. So I'm saying all that to say that gear is at minus 18. So I'm, I'm making sure I'm constantly consistent when I'm, when I'm coming in and out.
Okay, so yeah, you answered one, a question I was going to ask you from earlier. Is uh, yeah, I know you said that you are you kind of lean heavily on your VU meters while you mixing and, and getting your gain staging right there. So your your VU meter is calibrated to minus eighteen. Yes. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Okay. D, DB, DB full scale, and I know today in a lot of you know we have to be specific about when we say minus eighteen three. What what are we talking about? Because we could be talking about LUFS. We could be talking. Right. And I'm, I'm, I'm I know you know what I'm talking about, but I'm saying for, for sure. the public students, we don't know exactly where everyone is. So I'm saying on a scale of minus 18 dBFS, right? And that's decibels full scale. So there's different ways. And that's that's another thing that was like, hey, your workflow, I was always working in looking at the meters in Pro Tools Classic, mm. always. Right. And then I started going, okay, well, let me just try mixing, looking in a different way. You know what I mean? And so then now, I it depends on what I'm doing, but on my master, I'm always using the K, uh, what is it, K14? Hmm. What is it, K12, K14, K24? It's whatever one is in the middle. K, so I don't want to say the wrong thing. When y'all when y'all right click on the master fader, you'll see oh. that there'll be a list of all these different things of, of ways you can look at it. And I use the one that's in the middle of the Ks on my master because it gives you sort of like this RMS and instant and peak all at the same time. It's like looking at three different meters in one meter. Yeah. I also use the wide version of, of the faders. I don't know if people know that you can make the make the uh make the meters wide and small. Like I use the wide version just because I like to look at more information. What is that? Is that a, a command click on the on the meter? Uh, uh, something like yeah, that. A, a right click. Yeah. Right click on right. the meter and then go to wide, right? Well sometimes sometimes right clicking depending on what you're working on and how you have your pro tools set up. Sometimes command clicking doesn't give you the regular right clicking because that command has been, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's um, been mapped out. To another thing. It's been mapped to another thing. So I always say right clicking, if you right, however you get there, if it's whether or not that's, you know what I'm saying? Hitting it with, with uh, the uh, uh, control or yeah. with, with, you know what I'm saying? Hitting it with, with right clicking, it just depends on what you're on. But I, I right clicking is how you get to all of these things. If you just right click on your fader, you know, but you have to be on that meter part, and then you, you you have all these options of what you can do. Word up, word up, man! Definitely some gems right there, cause I, you know, I I'll be honest, I. I immediately went when they updated the meters and Pro Tools. I was like, ah, oh, nah, go back, classic meter, and turn this. I don't even want to <laughs> realize, try to understand what this new stuff is. Y'all didn't put on here. Give me very, my meters very, back. <laughs> very, very useful. So, so most of the time, my regular faders are in peak, and then my masters in that were like K14 or whatever or whatever. Whatever yeah. the K is, is K because there's a, a scale, and I'm remiss on saying the guy's name. It's it, it's it's based off of the guy who developed the system okay. and it looks really dope but then there's one that's 12 that, so obviously that's saying that that's going at 12 as your zero i think it's like minus four, i think it's 14 and then one's 24. don't quote me just look at it and i use the one in the middle <laughs> okay <laughs> word up man dope um yeah, oh so i do want to i kind of want to go to the moment though to where you move to new york and things start to change for you in your career as a mixing engineer. Um, can you can you talk about that? I know you was working on a, a project with D Dot and Memphis Bleak, and that kind of what what kind of spurred D Dot before Memphis Bleak. Okay. So what what actually happened is I moved from DC. Now now mind you, I'm gonna set the scenario so y'all can all understand life and mm -hmm. what's going on. By this time, it's 1999. My first child was born in 1996. My second child was born in 1999. I leave them, their mother, you know what I'm saying? Everything, them in the house. I say, I'm going to New York. Hmm. I still have to pay the rent in the place that my children and their mother are, you know what I'm saying? At the time, that's my ex-wife now, but it was my wife then. Yeah. Right? So I leave my family basically to go to New York because I'm like, I need to make it happen. So any little bit of money that I was making was going back to them to hmm. pay rent, to buy food, to do whatever. By Thursday, I guarantee you, I'm hitting one of my guys like, hey, can I borrow $5 to go get chicken wings and fries? Because I on Friday, last Friday, I sent my whole check back to DC. Yeah. Right? That's that's the type of thing I'm doing. I'm basically staying on my cousin's couch in Newark, New Jersey. Right? Well, really in Irvington at that point. He's living in Irvington, the same thing. Yeah. So I would get up, go to New York, go to work, you know, probably sleep there for three or four days, you know what I'm saying? Figure out where I could take a shower. I got plenty of friends in New York. I would either, you know, hop the train, run to Brooklyn, take a shower, or wherever I could shower at, I would figure it out. And I very rarely, like, went all the way back to Jersey. 
sort of thing because I wanted to be there. I was there every day. I was working on salary, which means I didn't get paid per session. I got a weekly check from okay. Derek. So no matter what I did, he had me all day long, hmm. right? Derek would normally be there from like, he, he'd probably wake us up at like 10, 11 o'clock when he got to the studio. We all knocked out from the night before. We get up, we doing whatever we doing and we keep going. He might leave at like nine, 10 o'clock at night which also means that we have two full rooms, two working studios that now you could just mash out and you could make beats, you could work on your craft, you could pull up reels and you know practice mixes. Uh, we had a, a, a tack scorpion board in there. Yeah. Really good, really, really uh, warm sound. It was like in between like sort of like a me and a, a sound craft. I don't know if you guys have ever been on a real like real deal sound. sound don't sleep on old sound crafts. And sound okay. crafts was like, heavy though, though not not the not the live because everyone knows the live soundcraft war but the soundcraft actually made an inline console mm -hmm. and it sounded so warm i love that soundcraft i broke it down and just kept the preamps out of it okay um, out of my mood yeah but we had a, a tack but we had like basically everything in there so that's what i was doing during that time i was basically i, I didn't move to new york without a plan so it's Derek Angeletti, like I said, is one of my OGs. So I went there knowing I'm going to work on, I had a job and then was like, okay, I need to go to New York now to work this job. So I was working on the Mad Rapper album for all of 99. And because Derek, the Mad Rapper album is sort of a compilation album, you know, I'm working with everybody. So it's just like, I already knew Puff, so I'm working with Puff. I'm, I'm working with Busta Rhymes. Busta Rhymes is on that album. Um, the Beat Nuts, you know what I'm saying, was big at the time. He's They on the album. Um, D Dot also had a conglomerate of people that he's putting out, which is like he had Picasso Black, yeah. he had uh, uh, Mae West and um, Mashonda. Mashonda was Swiss's first uh, wife. Mae West is now, you know, moved on, but it's just a bunch of people that he had in there. Um, and also our team of producers. So Derek was doing the same thing that Puff was doing. Puff went out and got the Hitmen, so he got a team of 10 producers that's underneath for him. Derek went out and did the same thing. Mm -hmm. So he had. This guy named Charlemagne, uh, not Charlemagne the guy, but Charlemagne the producer, who, who ended up doing um, the song on Blueprint 2, where Jay says, uh, Gu released the flute song, right? That's a Charlemagne okay. producer track. Okay. Um, he had this guy named Coptic, who was really dope, and he had a very young Kanye West. You know, like there was a bunch of kids in there that was producing and sending, sending and stuff, and that's what he was doing. So besides working on the Mad Rapper album, at that time, all of the hitmen were in-demand producers, you know, getting $50,000 per beat. Imagine that, $50,000 for one beat. Mm, mm, I, watched, mm. I watched Chucky clock like $150,000 one day in like an hour. So <laughs> three beats. Like, you would never stop it, making it, beats. <laughs> <laughs> it was, <laughs> that was the industry back then when you were in demand, you know what yeah. I mean? And Puff, at them as being hitmen, you would go to daddy's house and Puff had every remix in the world. He had so many remixes lined up. It's a whiteboard, you know what I mean? And it's yeah. just a list and you will go get me the, you know, the DAT, which basically on the the left side would be Simpty and on the right side would be a mono acapella. Mm -hmm. And you would run the left side, you would put it in the DAT machine and you would run the left side out into the beat machine, Simpty in. That way you could lock the vocals and you would bring that right side up on the board. Mm -hmm. And then that way, whatever the producer's making, that's how we would do all the remixes. So it was like that was also our day of remixing a lot of the you know songs that Puff had going on and Derek and then Derek would try one, Chucky would try one, Nasheen would try one, Stevie J would try, and whoever had the best one, that's who got the check. Yeah. And got the placement. You know what I mean? And that's that's how that rolled. But we're constantly trying different remixes and doing biggie albums and things of that nature. So that's that's what I was doing every day in there. And also like Goody Mob will come one day and that, you know, they're, they're making the, um, the world, what was the, the, the third album, World Something, whatever that third album is called. Mm -hmm. And very simply, they come in, Derek would look at me and he'd be like, okay, go in the closet and get Coptic number two, Coptic seven, uh, Kanye three, Kanye five, and these are just dats that have monthly beats. Mm -hmm. So Kanye was saying, you know, this is what I did for February. And he just <laughs> put that all on the dat and send it and he was supposed to get that out to the world and sell it. So that was the, the process of what we were doing for that whole year. That's dope, man. Open up a lot of doors just by being in the situation, being hungry. See, your, your story is definitely a lot like mine. You know, the way I started out, moved from St. Louis to New York, you know, uh, sleeping wherever I can, you know, trying to stay as much as possible in the studio. Definitely didn't go home every night. I'm like, you know, I can just crash here versus taking the train back to Brooklyn or whatever. And um, so. And again, I can, I'll, be, I'll be remiss if I didn't talk about team. Like, the yeah. team, like, Crazy Cat was a team. Like, 
not just the engineers, not just the producers, everybody that worked there, the street team, all of us. Imagine busting mm. down, yo, we, I can't afford a nick. I just told mm. you, I, I sent all of my money back to my family. So yeah. I'm taking 250, this dude's taking 250, and we buying a nickel bag. Like, that's how <laughs> much we was all together and all like, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. we used to, I'm, I'm giving you real rap. Like, no. I was so broke that after the artist would leave, I would walk around the studio and unwrap roaches and try to make a blunt out of like, like I'm telling you, <laughs> Yo. this is how broke I was. Like, I've been there. It was, it was the family. It was just like, that's what we did. That was the family. And that's, that's how we survived. Dope, man. Yo, that's that's super lit, man. Mad inspiring. <laughs> Mad inspiring yeah, for plenty, sure. Yeah, plenty of nights of, you know, just, just not having no money. Whoever had money but buy, you know, extra chicken or extra, you know, wings or you get cool with the dude. Like again, I'm my whole life basically we was in Jimmy Hensman's old studio, right? And that's mm. on twenty fifth. Basically that's across the street from where the forty forty is right now in New York. So that's on this side of Sixth Avenue. On the other side is where Baseline is, right? Later on, Baseline will be on 26, one block up, but on the other side of Sixth Avenue. So basically, that part of New York in Manhattan, so from, I know most of the studios, like we would come up to Quad and to all those other places is in the 40s. We was down in the 20s. So it was like that whole area I get cool with to the point of how you carry yourself outside just the way you talk to the dude at the corner store yeah. might get you a, a sandwich like, yo, bro, I know I owe you this much, but I got you on Friday when I get paid. Can I just have a, a rack of a bill of like $30? You know what I'm saying? Just to get a sandwich. Like, I would go in there and just be like, can you make me a sandwich and I'll pay you on Friday? Yeah. But yep. that's the company, build a rapport, build a relationship, and you cool with them and you know everybody. And, you know, yo, that's like, bringing it back to you building these relationships. It seemed like, you know, you were able to understand how to be everybody's friend and how to, you know, how to build that community and, and, and people leaned on you and they trusted you and, and they wanted you around. That's the big part of running a session. Like some people, they'll graduate from, from some of these schools and it's just like, that's great. You know how to move the chess pieces, but you don't know how to play chess. Mm. You just know how to move the pieces. Now I got to teach you the strategy of chess. Like once you learn how to move the pieces, that's all it is. Is like a compression ratio is not going to help you when you don't know how to run the session. Yeah. Well, you know, you know, that's on the recording end of, of how to get the best out of the artist. Right. So, and, and, and there's no strict manual. You got to like really figure this out. The best way is like, I'm not saying the best way. One of the things that I can relate it to is having children. Mm -hmm. Like all of my children act differently. My oldest daughter, she's going to do all her homework. She's going to get straight A's. She's also the person that like, if you flinch at her, she's going, oh my God, she's going to cry. You know what I mean? Like yeah. my second daughter, could do something wrong and I could beat her and the next day she gonna go outside and do the same thing again. You know, like, mm -hmm. right. it, it, it just depends, you gotta, artists are like that. So it's like, sometimes you you went and you know this girl can sing, you've been in her church and she's in her comfort zone and she's around people and she belts out this song. And as soon as she get in that booth and that, you know, red light come on, she like, and it's like, you gotta figure out how to make her comfortable. Mm -hmm. Maybe everybody gotta leave the room. Maybe, you know, like, did a, you gotta figure out what it is, or you've been working with an artist, and my philosophy is that if the artist knows the song, right? And I'm not talking about these people that like write the rap that fast and then just go in the booth and try to say it real quick. Like yeah. they don't memorize the rap, they don't do none of that, they don't put no time into the inflection and all. Like once you get to that point of knowing the song, I always say the studio is to record the song. You can make the song anyway. Hmm. Mm. Studio is to record the song. So okay. the time that we waste in the studio, like making, like, 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 like we already have the song, we already have the CD and we book the session and we in there and we trying to write. And it's just like, unless you're with a writer that has to be in the studio, it's sometimes it's better to write the song before you book the studio. Yeah. You see what I mean? Yeah. I'm, sometimes recording. cats don't even have a beat put picked out and they, they're in the studio. I've been in sessions. We in there for eight hours understand. picking beats, but <laughs> understand us as engineers and studio owners, everybody has a different thing. Yes. You want those hours. I get it. Yeah. I understand. <laughs> those hours. But as, as you know, as, as also too, in the creation of the song, I'm saying the person shouldn't even step in front of the microphone until they got all of this figured out. And a lot of people, I know the style of today. Somebody's going to yeah. immediately say, yo, go. I got a bunch of dudes that want to just get up there and freestyle their way through the song. And I'm like, that's fine. Bar for even, bar. In doing, even, even in doing that, the freestyle part that they work on, now they come back out of the boot and we listen down to the song. And I'm like, is there any place now that you know what you kind of wanted to say that you can improve on this? Can you say it better? Is there things we can add to it? 
all of those things affect us. Also, too, just technically, if, if the microphone is here and you, you took all this time to do a course and tell people about proximity effect and how far they should be, and immediately the person does this. The mic's right. here. Exactly. And they turn their face to, <laughs> to start reading <laughs> off of a phone. So you're projecting that way instead of projecting into the microphone. Yeah. So it's like all those little, or they start doing this, and then like now you're doing this. You're going up. Or... Yeah, it's, 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 you know, not being projected into the mic. So that's that's one of my biggest things, but that's that's a balance you gotta learn about how to deal with artists because some artists don't want you to say nothing. They like, I know what I'm doing, I did it just just record. Some artists are looking for you to actually coach them, which gets to another topic that engineers always ask me, like, ooh, when am I crossing this line of producing vocal coaching? Should I be getting paid extra for this? Right. They didn't pay me for vocal. It, it's, it's, it's a weird line and I'm, I'm you know, and I'm, I still don't have a direct answer. What I'm saying is, <laughs> yeah. is that you have to look at what type of artist you're dealing with and be able to kind of read them as to what it is they want to best serve them. Mm. And that's, that's the biggest thing. It's only, we are like barbers, which is a, which is a really weird thing because like mm. you go get your barber because he's really good at cutting hair. Right. Yeah. And but you, but you as the client are the final say. You're gonna sit down. He's gonna be like, "What do you want done?" And you're gonna be like, "Yo, I want a line here. I want my back to be round. I don't want a temple taper. I just want it to fade this way." And you're expecting him to know exactly what you want. But you as the client could come in and you know what? I want lines all through my head. I'm Kanye West, and I want. These. And you're gonna be like, the barber's gonna be like, "Yo, that's not gonna look good. That's our only job. Yeah, is to give our expertise and say, "Yo, that's not going to sound good." Right. And if that person then goes, "No, I want you to do," then that's your job. They came. If the person want to come in and belch on the mic for three hours, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And exactly. I mean, I'm going too far to make a. No, point. but for real. They're, they're the client. Of course, it's our job and our expertise to say what we think will sound good. Mm. What can help us? What can help the song? These are suggestions that we're supposed to make as the expert or professional in this situation. But don't get it twisted. That The, the client always has the final say. Yeah. So there's been plenty of times where I don't agree with some things and I got to go along with it because that's what the client wants. And then sometimes you find out, hey, even though I didn't agree with this initially, maybe it actually turned out for the best. What, what you will also find out too is that when they fail and you actually were honest about telling them what was wrong, they're gonna come back to you and be like, yo, I should have listened to you. And they will listen over and over and over again after that. Yeah. Because they like, you know what? He caught that before I even put it out or she caught that before I put it out. So it, mm -hmm. it starts to build confidence in you know what you're talking about. Absolutely, man. And that that having that whole confidence, that relationship with the artist, I think that's when you start to you know, build up a long term relationship with them to where you know when to say something and what lines you can cross, whether you need to be setting up and pushing buttons or if you can produce them and say, you know what, you could deliver this line or maybe this lyric even uh, could be a little tighter. Right. Um, but that comes from knowing the artist, knowing how to read the room and, and just kind of being present. You got to be real mindful of the way that you say it. Like, yeah. You can't just be like, that's ass, that's garbage. That's the, you know, like, it's the way you got to say it. You have to, like, again, these are artists and they're very sensitive about their art. So it's yeah. just like the way that you say it. Um, one of the, one of the best pieces of advice that I got was to always phrase it as a question. So okay. instead of saying that if somebody has a, if somebody has a thing that they're doing, let's say somebody comes in and, and again, we get into certain points nowadays where people like sit on YouTube and they become experts in five minutes after watching like one YouTube video, like as an artist. And they're like, oh, I watched this thing on YouTube. Is that supposed to do this? And I was just like, what if, instead of saying, no, 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 that's, that's not right. You should do this. Then you'd be like, well, what if we did this? How about those sort of phrases of, of if you're really saying no, but you're, you're making it into a question so that the person thinks they're answering. So you can say, well, what if we tried this? How about this? What if, right. So then it, it, it's a little bit, um, 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 it takes away the defense mechanism of saying you're going directly against the person. Just phrase it as a question when you're trying to make these suggestions. That's, that? that's, that's what we're really, like, the first day, you, you mentioned Bleak, but the first day I was in with Bleak and he's rhyming and, and I'm very used to being with my crew and correcting people's rhyming and I'm harsh with like my friends, with people yeah. I know and my friends, when you're not gonna get offended, oh, we go, that's what makes the best, oh, that's garbage. Dude. Then that's what you oh, said, that's ass. <laughs> what are you doing? Like, but I, I would say to him, I'd be like, yo, what if, what if we tried this? What if we took out the word the right there? It might 
have your bounce in your pocket, go. You don't need that word for the song. Or what if we tried that? And he was just like, Goo, nobody's ever done that to me before. Yeah. Nobody's ever like vocal coached a rap. Like at that point, he's like, I'm a rapper. Nobody, vocal, you vocal coach, uh, you know, singer right. at that point. It was just like, nah, I'm vocal coaching a rapper. Yes, you can say it better. That's vocal <laughs> coaching. And from that point on, he was just like, I need Goo back. I'm not stepping in the studio without Goo. Mm. And that, that, was, that was my, you know, beginning of us being really good friends. Without that, there would have been no Jay-Z stopping by to check on Bleak. And there would have been no come to baseline. There would have been no rock. Dope, man. So definitely get providing more value than what you there for necessarily. See, a lot of us, we sometimes get so pent up on, hey, I'm paid to do this, so I'm not going to step outside of that and, and offer anything else. But, you know, hey, especially if you care about the music, you're passionate about what you're doing, find ways to give more value to the people that you're serving, to the client, to the music, because ultimately, you know, I always say that we are – uh, servants um, as audio engineers we serve the music and we serve our uh, is serve the artists you know I'm very big though on like when I said I didn't have the answer of, of and that's I know that's a huge question for people because I do see a lot of us a lot of engineers saving producers saving artists you know you may get the files and it's just like you start doing drops that's arranging yeah you're producing you know like and the arrangement can make or break the song and it's just like one of the ways you can you can go about that is just to present your arrangement and to be like, look, this is how you gave it to me. It would sound like this with just my mix. If, if I'm just mixing sonics, mm -hmm. but if I'm moving this around and if, if I'm allowed to take the drums out here, that's going to make me do a reverse reverb into that to do this and the, like now you're 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 adding on to arrangement and you should be compensated for that or at least get the credit. The right. credit sometimes is worth way more than the money yes. because if you have things to point to for other clients to say, yeah, I'm on this album. I did this. I did that. That's that's almost sometimes more important than just what the actual that quick like check is from from that one gig. You want to make sure that your credit. That's why I'm big on no matter who. If, if, if somebody did a string overdub, whoever the engineer was that mm. recorded that, his, his name is going to be on that album. Mm. Forget the cash. We want the credit. We yeah. talking about them album credits. We want them credits, man. That's that's definitely huge. So, how would you um, approach a situation like that? Like, are you literally going to you know whoever's in charge of this record and saying, hey, like you said, like this is my production that I actually added to this. Here's how it um, could sound like, and here's what I'm asking for in return. Or, yes. and, and and let me let me be all the way straight up. Yeah, I know. I know people are gonna be like, "Oh, it's not always that easy." Yes, it's easier for me because I work with a lot of people that I know, that I'm friends with. I've already established these relationships with them. I'm saying that at some point, if you're doing all of that work, you yourself should bring it up to the artist, to the A and R, to whatever person that is in charge of doing that, crediting not only that, but but you know the actual payment of, of people understanding that that is a job, right? right? There used to be just, just, and just Johnny Pate is an arranger. Right. Straight. He was, he was an arranger before he did, you know what I mean? His own records. He was just an arranger. He would take what other people wrote and just arrange it. That was his job. Shaft and Africa and all that. He's arranging. Mm -hmm. So it's just, you have to find the right space and the right pocket of when to say it. Right. But it's always better to do it earlier than later. Don't do it after the record has been turned in. They already have the final. They're about to put it out. And then now they're doing album credits. They're trying to remember a session that was like three months ago. Who did what on what and who played what. Do it at the session or when you're turning the mix back in or whenever. Just be like, look, I need the credit for this, 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 and this. And if the person doesn't give it to you, don't wow out. Okay. Don't be like, duh, duh, duh. just say, look, bro. This is next time realize that I'm I'm not gonna put my I'm just gonna mix the record. I'm not gonna sit here and do a range. So y'all gonna have to figure that out. Y'all gonna have to but realize what I added to the record. Right. You know what I'm saying? You don't wanna you don't wanna lose the client, but you also wanna make sure that they know that you're adding things to make the record way better. Now, again, I never had to have a discussion with somebody to be like, yo, I need to get points on this album. I need to get da -da -da, because I'm in a crew that is looking out for me. Jay Z suggested that to me not the other way around mm -hmm. okay so like, oh, i value what you do here i'm going to make sure you get a point like how rock and roll engineers used to get a point so right. i was just like okay that was the first time that idea was even introduced to me was when he said it mm. you see what i'm saying so okay then that, that made me start doing it with other people and being like okay if i'm a, if he can do that you can at least do that like so that was the I, and i'm not going to lie and say i've like 
been through these uncomfortable situations of doing it with people that I don't know. It's, it's, it's like Jay-Z is like, you know what I'm saying? It's like my brother. So it's not a difficult situation for us to discuss. Yeah. So, but it is uncomfortable sometimes talking business, which means that you have to know what type of person you are. I'm the type of person that I like to manage myself. I like to talk business. Now, don't get it wrong. I have a manager, a whole vein manager, right? You know what I'm saying? Okay. So it's just like, I, but I like to talk my business myself, especially when I have a personal relationship with that person. Sometimes you may not. You may want to separate yourself and have the manager talk. That's a great thing. You know, like to have that uh, uh, pause, like that buffer in between. You know what I'm saying? Like that sort of thing is great because then you don't have to deal with the headache. You and the artist never get into an argument. Y'all could just be in a super creative place and other people are dealing with the business and you're that type of person. Again, it depends on who you are and what your your, your style of working is and how you like to work. Yo, definitely gems out there. Definitely gems, man. So that's that's definitely something I, I know a lot of people are struggling with. And because like you said, it used to be whole jobs. It used to be a vocal producer and then a, an arranger and then the music producer and the engineer. And then that, that's just the recording engineer. And then there's the mixing engineer, right? Um, but nowadays, like all those jobs are being wrapped up into one. So you're doing the well, production, the, the recording. Thing, you gotta really speak out. Yeah. If you're the mix engineer, and people are sending you a session that is not put together. That is the most annoying thing in the world. Meaning, oh. somebody's sending me a two track. Somebody's sending me vocals that were done to that two track. Somebody's sending me the track that will be. There's three, there's two other guests and they recorded in different places and now I gotta take those and put them all in a session. Guess what? Right. They're all at different bit depths and all at different things. So <laughs> things start stretching. And now, I'm before I can even mix, I'm constructing the record. Yeah. And it's just like, yo, did you pay me to mix or are you like get all this together before you give this to me? Like that's unfair mm -hmm. to the mix engineer that he's constructing your record. He's supposed to mix your record. Mm -hmm. And I know people are like, ooh, what if, if I if I record it to a two track and then the artist just give me the beat or the track? Yeah, I get it. I'll put the beat in, but I mean consistently more and more and more now. I spend more time setting up my session than I actually do mixing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do, do you think that uh vocal tuning is uh producing or more the job of the mix engineer uh production yeah okay that's that's production vocal tuning is absolutely production okay yeah we do it because we're like it's so it's like <laughs> almost annoying to our ears to right. hear off vocal so we're just like okay let me tune this real quick because it's just all oh, it's just naturally you'll hear it but like that is really the job of uh, before there was, before you had the ability to tune, when you had to say, no, that's not right, go sing it again. Mm. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so it's still that same person's that's job. Same person's job. Yeah. It, that's, again, that's supposed to be the job of the recording engineer when they're in the session. If the person hits a wrong note and you're like making a decision now, the, you know, I'll look at somebody and be like, I always like the person to sing it again. You see what I'm saying? Yes. But in today's world, I get it. We have all these tools. But you're not supposed to be sitting there melodining like all these different tracks as a mix engineer. It's just like, give me, because it takes away, now I'm not in my mix bag. No. Now I'm in my fixed creator record bag as a producer because because all of us probably produce too. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to turn these hats around and know when to be what. So it takes me out of my mix bag. Like I, 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 if I got to set all that up, I got to leave for like an hour and come back and be like, okay, now I'm ready to mix. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. I've been thinking about little things or like there's all these mistakes of, you know, somebody put a two track in and there's this much space in the beginning so that the grid is a little off and the person didn't sit there and like take that little space out. And so now every time you're flying, something is getting worse and worse and worse. It's like I shouldn't have to be worried about these things as, yeah. as the mix engineer. Or it up. You can't even get, get creative. You fixing more than you mixing and it changing your whole vibe, man. Um, do how long does it typically take you to to mix a song nowadays? Once I get to that point of like everything is is correct, like when I say correct, I don't even mean I mean like that, like the session is put together and I can press play and it's the way it's supposed to be with drops and all the other stuff. Okay, roughly three hours, four hours. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It depends on how intensive or how what the lack. Sometimes people think the more tracks you have, the longer it takes. For me, sometimes for me when I'm given like this really rough two track and that's all it is and it's no drums and it's just a sample and I gotta dig in, sometimes that's harder mm -hmm. to dig into because I have less things to play with to actually make it sound good than it is when I got 
50 tracks of separated things and I have all the control in the world. So yeah. length of time just depends on, on the quality of what I get. You know what I mean? That yeah. it, but a lot of times I'm telling you there's that I'm going back and there's clicks and pops. There's fades where there don't need to be fades. It's edits that are wrong, you know, punches that you can still hear the little clips. And I'm just like, how did y'all, because y'all just recorded this, bounced it, and then you didn't go over it. You just, and I'm like, that, it killed yeah. me. So if, if everything is right, three to four hours, but I like to like mix it, walk away from it, come back, listen to it, reference other things. So I, I also too like to mix whole projects. Mm. You know, I don't always get that, but I like to like, after mix eight, I'm I'm kind of listing them, you know what I mean? In a, in a certain order and listening down and be like, oh, this one has way more low end than this one and this one, the voice is way bright. I like am comparing it to other mixes that I'm doing on the, on the same project. So yeah. Those sort of things I'll tweak and tweak and tweak until I have it like, okay, now all eight of these songs sound really good. Dope. So it just, it just depends. If it's just a one-off, it's like three or four hours, but I'll, I'll kind of vibe with it and just try to figure out what it is. But very, 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 very rarely do I get like perfect sessions. Like <laughs> Word up. Now in this is, were you, are you saying that this is like working with people at the highest level? Because obviously you're working oh, with yeah, people yeah, at the yeah, highest yeah. level and you're still receiving yeah, 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 sessions yeah. that you're like, what the hell yeah. is going on? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because even though they're at the highest level, it's like they may not have an engineer in there with them. A lot of artists are into this. I'm recording myself. Then, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So that, that could be the case. Or just just logistics is of what I'm saying. So if, if said producer gave you the two track, you made a song, you may not have gone back to said producer to get the multi-track until he got his first half. That may not have happened. So the producer may be on purpose holding off that multi-track. Like, yo, they didn't pay me my first half yet. Y'all said, y'all demoed it. Y'all said y'all liked the song, but I ain't seen it. it, it producers are like, yo, until that check come, that beat is over. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? So they may not get, it's like, so it's at the final mix stage that an A&R or whoever, even on a really high level stuff. Now these are, Again, I'm not running into this on a Jay Z project because I'm in it from top to bottom, so right. I'm controlling the project. But I still deal with other artists where it's just like it's not even about the person doesn't know what they're doing. It's that certain processes haven't gone down, and we're in this thing of none of us are in the same room anymore, mm. right? That's one of the negatives of of, yeah. of this not having to go to the studio all at the same time. So back, and I, I don't want to sound like I'm old or but but that's one of the things I wish we did of like getting in the same room. Because it's, once you have the producer, the artist, the A and R, the engineer, all so many decisions can be made quick instead of me doing something, bouncing it, sending it to you, sending it to three different people, y'all making different decisions. I'm like the artist is like, yo, I need like one dB up on the snare. The producer is like, no, turn the snare down three. And it's like y'all make that decision on your own. Come back and tell me what y'all like. Right. Yeah. So it, sometimes when you're in the same room, you can do all that in the same day and. Everybody, it's, it's, you don't know, as, and this is the other thing for us as engineers, you gotta really ask these questions. What are you listening to the mix on? Hmm. So you take all this time and you do this incredible mix and you send it and they're listening on a phone. They're listening in a car that has the bass all the way turned up, you know what I mean? Or it's not flat in the car, or they like just, they, they got surround sound and they in their living room just listening to the mix, right? I, it, 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 I used to laugh sometimes when like, Puff will call and be like, let me hear the mix. I'm like, over the phone? Yeah. <laughs> like, what is that going to tell you? <laughs> over the phone? Like, yeah, hold the phone. I'm like, what? Like, you never know what the, per you know what I mean? What the client is listening on. Yes. So there's all these factors that could run into why they're making edits or making decisions without, you know what I mean? Without yeah. you being there. Or it's really tough sometimes. But when you're all in the same studio, you know exactly the same system. We all listening to the same speakers. It's, it's better. I know everybody can't be in the same room, but it's just like, that's yeah. one of the things we lost. So sometimes even a Zoom is enough to be like, you know, let's let's talk about this in, in, in person versus yeah. like emailing back and forth and having comments and that's the worst. <laughs> and you start finding out that like managers started making comments instead of the artists and it's like, oh. <laughs> Word up, man. Uh, yo, I gotta. I, I want to talk about something else real quick, just shifting gears. I'm seeing you a lot on the uh, Kanye West Genius documentary. You know, all the studio uh, shots and stuff. We catching Guru in there. Um, you know, and, and that got me thinking about my own career and 
how a lot of times when I were when I was like in these situations and in these rooms where great things are happening, like kind of iconic moments, I was never thinking about it like that. Or, or were you kind of realizing the magnitude of the work you were doing when you were doing it? Absolutely not. Yeah. Um, my my biggest thing was just to make the best records. Um, you know, I, I realize that I'm affecting culture, but you know, to the degree the when you say that specific word, the magnitude of it, no, I had to like really really go back outside to then then i'm seeing like you know people bumping the music and how it's affecting different people I, again i'm locked in that room in a good way you know what i'm saying yeah for a very for a good 10 years i'm, I'm that specific room that you see on the kind of west that is my day every single day for 10 years and um almost like 24 hour periods of being in that room i would barely leave if i went out I'm involved with the project. You know what I'm saying? It's an album release for a project that I worked on. If I go to the tunnel, Bleak is performing or Jay is performing. I'm not just at the tunnel just to chill. Like, yeah. or, you know, that, I wasn't that guy. So I was constantly figuring that out as I would go back outside. Then, you know, a couple of years go by and it's, and it's a lot of work that's like winning, you know, again, I don't do this for like accolades of Grammys and how many records did you sell and this, how many, uh, yes, that's what you use as a litmus test for your job of, of like, when somebody's like, well, what have you done? And like, oh, well, I'm a Grammy award winning so-and-so. It looks good, it sounds good. Mm -hmm. I did this just to bust your ass. I'm the <laughs> best, I'm the best. I do this the best. I'm, my song is better than your song. My, you know, like our yeah. biggest thing was just like, bro, let me go in the office and I just made Old Boy last night and turned this up. And I know people on Murder Inc. side is going to hear this and you ain't got nothing to beat this. Yeah. That's what I did. This, That's it's why. always been that. It's always just been like, I want to make the best music. So the rest of it and, and the thing of personal gratification, right? Like learning equipment. I'm just that guy. I'm, I'm the guy that took apart VCRs. I'm the guy that fixes bikes. I'm the guy that wants to know how systems work. I'm the guy that, you know, you're supposed to call and like, get Dave Malapo to come down and fix the SSL. But if I'm in the middle of a session and something goes down, you better believe I'm pulling it up and I'm soldering, I'm getting through it and putting it back. You, you know how many times we've yeah. done, like, you're really not supposed to do that, but it's just like, <laughs> I don't got time. Like, right. so symptoms are my thing. And, and I, that's just my, what I love. Yeah. And, and that's really why I do it. It wasn't, it's not for the, the accolades or, or none of that thing. It's really just to be like, you know what I mean? I'm I'm, I'm, I'm a step on this basketball court and I'm gonna do the best. Mm. What's your favorite uh, set of studio monitors right now? Favorite set, always, forever, and it's tense. Right. Um, just because I know them like the back of my hand. Um, the Pro Acts, I love, you know what I'm saying? Absolutely love them. They're very expensive, though. Uh, yeah. So I can say that everybody get those. I have a pair of, um, uh, I wish I was at the crib, because what happened was, I got stuck in LA. Um, not even they're not even there's something there's something else. I wish I had a picture of my setup. Because there's some off brand, but they sound really good. So I was in LA, right? I was from I'm from Jersey, living in Jersey. Yeah. Um, flying back and forth to go deal with Jay. You know what I'm saying? Jay will call me. So like say 2017, right? You get you get a call like January 3rd, right after New Year's. Hey dude, come on, I'm ready. Boom, boom, boom. So that's probably like four or five months of me living in the soap hotel. Um, going back and forth, you know what I'm saying, to the studio every day, recording Jay. Then, you know, we put that out, then we go on tour. So then I'm away from home again for like, you know what I'm saying, another four or five months or whatever it is. So I would hit the crib just for like Thanksgiving and Christmas and then do it all over again. So for like three years, I was living in a sofa hotel, basically, right, mm -hmm. and on the road. <laughs> yeah. So when, um, when COVID hit, it was like, okay, I can't live in a hotel no more. Let me get a spot. And like two things happened. I didn't have any equipment out here. Like I, I went home and got my necessities. So obviously, you know, I want I wanted to get my Equinox was already in um, No ID Studio because I was using that for when we was doing like uh, Vince Staples and all that other stuff that he was doing. Like Dion was going through this like super dope distortion phase mm -hmm. on those like Vince Staples out. So I was using a lot of that to, to get the distortion. The preamps on there are incredible. Okay. Um, but needless to say, I made a like a quick setup, bought a desk just put my equipment in this desk and immediately I was like, you know what? I've never sat at a desk to mix. <laughs> and now I'm in the music. Like I'm so used to having this SSL or a board in between me and the speakers. I was like, I kind of like this, like sitting at a desk, I'm in it yeah. sort of thing. That was prominent from the very beginning of like the, the, the start of quarantine. I was like, maybe I will mix at a desk now because it just feels real good of like, 
I'm a little bit tighter with the with the stereo imaging versus I'm used to the you know go to a big studio with styles and that. But there's a desk in between you and so the triangle is way bigger. Yeah. That's creating versus like the triangle I make on a desk. And I just went out and I bought like these El Chico speakers from the Guitar Center, mm -hmm. and they have like a setting on the back that's like if you're this far away from the wall, put it on this setting. Da 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 da. And I and I'm like, yo. <laughs> the bass response on these, I don't, and I don't know necessarily if it's where I have it placed in my room. Sometimes I'm like, is it acoustic treatment or is it me just learning the room? You mm -hmm. know what I mean? There's like, so I, I figured out my space in that quick, like, it's COVID. I'm not going back to my comfortable spot in Jersey. I got to mix now. I got projects I got to do now. Yeah. So it was learning another room, but I just learned it real quick on some cheap speakers, and I was just like, it's, it, it's really you learning the speakers. So no matter what you choose, I've always been NS10s, I've always been Genelex. Mm -hmm. Genelex can be a little bit too forgiving yeah. on the high end, you know, like, it, 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 but it depends on, you know, what your taste is. Um, and when I say too forgiving, I mean, just like, it's too good. Like sometimes it's, it's, it's such a high fidelity speaker that when you're trying to find problems, it's, it's almost like wearing Dr. Dre headphones. Right. There's already an EQ on the Dr. Dre headphones. You can't mix in Dr. Dre headphones. Because there's already an EQ, a heavy EQ on. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like so, yeah. it's that sort of thing with a, with a regular speaker. But more than the brand of the speaker is you learning the speaker. So, you know, I, I'm definitely grabbing a pair of Proax for for um, when I get back to LA. Okay, okay. So you living in LA now? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> sometimes, sometimes. Yes. Yes. I'm no. I'm being because as an East Coast dude, that's why I'm never living in LA and yeah. now I live. I've been living in this spot for the past two and a half years since COVID started. So it's like, now, nah, yes, I live in LA. Okay, okay. Look, man, I, I ain't nobody gonna get on you for sipping lattes and all that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, uh, I appreciate. I don't want to hold you up too much. I just want to give a, a few um, questions. We didn't do. We didn't do. What time is it now? We didn't do enough questions. So we gotta do at least another like 15, 20 minutes, maybe a half hour. Enough questions. Come here. That's a bet, man. So cool. I'm gonna go to the Wavy Seals Elite. Yo, if y'all got a question, um. Go ahead and let's uh, hit the hand raise feature and then I'll unmute you or then unmute yourself and um, let's just but throw your hands up first. Shout out to the Wavy Seals Elite. Um, if you on, if you ain't a member of the Wavy Seals Elite, then you, you need to tap in. I got them uh, right here live. So we got Big Ben, the product. Anybody can ask them um, super technical questions if they want to, too. It doesn't have to be just philosophy or whatever. If you, if you have a very specific Anything from philosophy, basics, all the way to specifics. All right, for sure. So we're gonna let's get it kicked off with Big Ben. Go ahead, uh, Ben, and unmute yourself. What's up, Guru? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right. Good to meet you. Nice to meet you, man. Um, so I had a question. You were talking about um, two tracks being a little bit harder than track outs. Mm -hmm. I was kind of curious how you go about mixing that in uh, your record and. Uh, how you make everything cohesive as as you would in um in the in the track outs like i know it's a little bit harder to to break down frequency so i was curious what your approach was on that there's a couple of them right so before before where we when i was on a board and say i had something like and let's just say the whole program makes me track let's just say it's a sample right we, me and Just kind of came up with a way of doing like multi-band compression and EQing before multi-band compression and EQing existed. What we would do is we'd somebody give us a sample, right? And I'd take that sample and I would multi multiple times on the board. So these first two are gonna be like my super lows. These next two are gonna be my, my lower mid-range. The next two are gonna be the higher, you know what I'm saying, mid-range. And then the next one is gonna be the highs, right? So at least I have it broken into frequency ranges at this point. Um, and then I would do different things to those different individual parts and then put them all back together, right? That's one way of doing it. Then when we got into multiband compressors and compressors and multiband EQs, right? Then there, there is such a thing as that, meaning like, um, of course, an EQ is going across a, a bunch of different bands. But the beautiful thing that I love now is that we have um, dynamic EQs, you know what I'm saying, and dynamic compressors and like, things that can affect just this frequency range. So I can like set this up in a Pro-Q3 that if, if this particular frequency keeps popping out and popping out and popping out, I can set it to where every time it crosses that threshold, it ducks, you know? These things that we can control that, you know, you, you don't have the individual instruments or tracks, but we do have the tools now to help us do that. 
And then I had put up on my page not too long ago the waves. Um, what was it called? The one where you a studio free. rack. The wave studio, studio rack. Thigh. Studio a blessing, <laughs> a super blessing because it's like you could break it out in so many different ways. And I know a lot of people were like, "Oh, it's too much process." And I'm like, if you look at that picture, all of the plugins are not activated, right? It's just one instance of a way that I like to work with things. So there's there's ways of breaking down different frequency pockets and also too inside of that you can break that down into like say a, a frequency range but then you can also add a parallel as one of those things and start adding like effects and reverbs to just that frequency so i may be able to add re on on just a two track i may be able to add reverb or delays to just the highs or just the high mids or just the you know what i mean so if i'm if i'm trapped with like just a two track component mm -hmm that somebody gave me, you still got to make that knock and make it sound good. So I'll go through all those processes to really see. But sometimes it's enough where maybe the producer did a drop somewhere. He gave me just the kick and a snare somewhere real quick. I'll take that one and layer it underneath of the two track. I'll try to filter out if I can, you know what I mean, get to where it's just a bass line. Then now I can control that bass line and put it back in with the two track. And, you know, I'm, I'm big now on, on a lot of like parallel um, compressing and, par and just parallel effects because it the thing about parallel is that it gives the the presence without adding a lot of volume right so it'll give you more excitement without you having to turn things up and there's a difference you can you know there's excitement that you can bring that'll almost give you like trick your ears into thinking there's like three decibels more of volume and my meter didn't move you know what I mean so it's just like excitement and volume are two different things the same way amplitude and volume are two different things yeah. So I hope that I hope that answers your question. But the, the main thing is, that, again, for everybody that's in here, I know the scenario. You're working with a rapper. They bought a two track or they, they took it off of um, off of uh, YouTube or whatever. You know what I'm saying? And that's all you got. And you got to start digging into it. So at, at the end of the day, know your tools, like be able to grab like the um, like the V3 or, or any anything that, you know, start to get into mid and side EQing so that you can then EQ things around vocals, right? Or you may be able to dip some of the middle and a little bit more than just the, the center plug in by waves is great. Yeah. It'll pull the center down, but then you may want to throw an EQ that has mid and side on it. And that means learning your EQs, very simple things. Like the pro, uh, the reason I keep saying pro Q3 is not that I'm, I'm like doing a commercial for fab filter, but it's like a very powerful thing that doesn't give you a lot of latency. Right when you when you throw that up, it doesn't automatically say, oh, uh, you know, there's 1,000, you know, what I'm saying samples that is using. Up. It may say 43 or 30 or whatever it is, but that's a powerful EQ that can do everything that I'm talking about with the dynamics of each bandwidth. You know, what I'm saying of, of each of each point, and also with um, doing mid side and all the other creative things that you could do with that EQ. So that those are some of the things that I would do, and you'd be surprised at like what you can do with with sitting the vocals inside of an already done two. Word up. Thank thank you. Yes, sir. Dope. Good question, Ben. Yo, let's go to uh Sasu. What's good with you, man? What's going on, brother? Uh not much, man. Just chilling, listen to you talk. Um, man, I just want to tell you, man, I think that your story is uh is really interesting, man. And um how you were just like you were in the, the rooms and stuff and you were just like, oh, you know, I'm gonna make it happen. And um it's like to me it was like you put yourself in a in a place where it's like I have to make it happen, and you surround yourself with people that's like, "Yo, we're not going, we're not going to bullshit each other. We're going to do this right. We're going to get it right." And I really like that that story, and the fact that you got a kid, and it's just like, "Yo, that's just like crazy." Because like, um, because I, I used to watch some of your stuff. I watched some of the stuff like um, you were talking about Ableton or whatever, and it's so it's just so interesting because I'm a producer myself and I'm an artist. And it's so you're like your story kind of like relates to me in a situation. So, you know, and so that I would think for myself when you're talking about artists, um, I believe when the artist is like nervous or something, it's more because of the fact that we're thinking about who's in the room with us. And so we're thinking that we're supposed to sound perfect. We're we're not doing the music for ourselves, we're doing it for other people. So that's the reason why like artists would be like, yo, I can't get this out. It's not because of that. It's because you're nervous and you're you're afraid that people are going to judge you, right. when the whole world is going to judge you regardless. Mm -hmm. So, but let, um, me, let me say this. Let me say this to you, and, and this is not to stop you. 
Yeah. When, when when I write, right, my, my weakness is writing. Right. Um, I'm very good at math and science. I can, right. I can literally, I was talking about this earlier with, with Cash, our labor manager. I was like, oh, I could do calculus in my head. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But I have very good concepts. I have no problem with public speaking. I have like all that stuff is easy. Enough. If you ask me to take these beautiful concepts that I have and write them down in an official mm-hmm. paper, my English teacher will always go, Google, great concept, great thought. You are advanced for your years, but your spelling and your punctuation is horrible. Right? right. So I'm saying that to say that when I write, I just I just spill out. Right. And I'm just writing, writing, writing. I don't care what the punctuation or whatever it is. You know what I'm saying? I'm right. no, I'm gonna go back and fix it. You see what I'm saying? But I gotta get this idea out. So right. when you're doing that, when you're being creative, there is no like wrong or being nervous. I'm just like, is that you are nervous, but I'm saying there is no wrong. Yeah. Like you're trying to get it out. And I'm not saying there's no wrong in terms of hitting a wrong. You know if you're hitting a wrong note. I mean in being yeah. creative and trying things and like what do I want to do and what do I want to talk about. Just express yourself. And then later on you go back and you edit it. You just be like, well, yeah. that wasn't I don't, I don't really feel like that. That wasn't good. Let me say this, let me say that. You know, and again, it's it's I understand what you're saying, where the nervousness comes from. Yeah. That, to me, that nervousness is excitement. That is the uh, like Quincy Jones says, like the God part coming in the room, you know what I'm saying? Like that is the universe telling us like, look, that's that's what that is. Mm-hmm. So those are the things, that feeling of, of I need to get it out is the dopest because you know when you do it, when you're like, oh, I hit the thing that I love, this sounds really good. And, and Absolutely. You, when you do it, this is another point, when you do something really good, you don't have to ask people, they're going to tell you. Yep. You know what I'm there's gonna Absolutely. be a song where you like have you ever had somebody come and like play a song and explain the song as they play the song like yo this is da, da, da. and it's like yo if the song's really good you don't have to explain the song to me yeah you as yeah. the artist are never going to have the chance to explain your song to a hundred thousand people right <laughs> they gotta press play and like it you know like yeah. that sort of thing so it's, it's it's all about the feeling i don't think you should fight it but then if you notice yourself that like, hey, the people being in the room are making me nervous, then you need to kick the people out of the room, even if they're right. friends. Just to be like, yo, can, can plenty of artists do that. Can I get my space real quick just to lay it down? As soon as I'm done, y'all come out the lounge or come out the kitchen if you're at the home or y'all go in the other room while I'm in the studio and I'll let y'all hear it when I'm done. Right. You know what I mean? Sometimes you may need to do that. Yeah, and, I, I, and I absolutely agree with that. You know, because it's it's times like, I like I used to do that myself. Like, what you think about this? And I'm like, no, nah, I'm gonna just chill off on that because it's like, I don't need to do that. Like you said, like, it's, if it's dope, it's going to be dope. You know what I'm saying? So I'm not going to put that worry on my, on myself because that's too much. I can't, I can't for me personally sit there and try to explain myself to the whole world. That's just a waste of time. And that's just too much weight on myself. But, um, also too, like, um, about analog gear, do you think that analog gear will ever fade out and it will just stick to emulation? No. Okay. There's always going to be analog gear. Analog is analog and emulations are emulations and it's comparing apples and oranges and both are great and both have their position and their point. So I never, I, you you will, you could go back to every interview I've ever done. I, it's pointless to argue digital versus analog. They are two <laughs> different things. You see what I'm saying? So each one, you, you should learn like what the two things do well and try to like, so that's why I do a hybrid sort of thing. It's not to say that I, I have great mixes that are in the box completely, right? I have great mixes that are all analog. I have great mixes that are a combination of the two. It's just, there are advantages to working in a digital domain that you don't have in the analog domain. And there's advantages to the analog domain that you don't have in digital. It's just it's just not the same thing. You, you understand what I'm saying? One is, I think the, the mistake comes when we say like, this is supposed to sound exactly like this. It, that's impossible. You know what I'm saying? So no, no two 1176s sound exactly the same. I'm talking about to the point where we like put put a plug in up and we put this 1176 up and then we have a scope and oscilloscope and we're looking at how fine the way it's like if you do that to two red, there's none in the world that are going to match perfectly. Right. So it's sort of a pointless argument. You know what I mean? But you can't as much as as much as we're on this thing of trying to teach and here's here's the point. Let me walk you through it since we're here and we're going to take the time and really explain this. You start in a you start in a completely analog world, right? And one of the things that we saw was like the first of all, you only got twenty four tracks, you know, on a reel. The the twenty fourth track is Simpy that's on it, right? That's the thing we use Society of Motion Picture 
and television engineers created a code so that everything can lock up in the studio, right? That's what SIMPTY is called. So really, if you was tight as an engineer, you know what I'm saying? You didn't really want to record on channel 23 because you might get some dropout on the SIMPTY on channel 24. So it's really busting you down like 22 tracks, right? Then we figured out a way like, okay, let's put two of these together, right? That means we got to have a box to sync these two together. You know, it takes a second, you know, to lock these two together. Cool. That's but I'm still only on 44 tracks. Then it's like all the things I would have to do at that point, right? I'm in a completely analog world. So Faith comes in to work with Chucky Thompson. We throw up a two track of the beat. She sings all the, we, we would have her sing a one scratch lead and then she's doing all her background so that we could flesh this out. Then I do a blend of those backgrounds and I would sample it and then record that. Now we didn't have enough money in the beginning to be doing two reels. So I would record over those vocal sheets. Them vocals is gone. We're never going to hear those again. This blend is the blend. You know what I'm like all the steps we had to go through. Then it's like, okay, all this hiss. Now, if Chucky is playing real analog keyboards and we started this session at 10 in the morning, and now it's lunchtime and it's two in the afternoon and he comes back at three, I guarantee you I got to retune those keyboards because they drift. Analog keyboards drift. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So there's, again, there's these minuses. Anybody that's like me, I got, I'm six five, my fingers are this big. Anytime you try to replace the battery on a clav, a real clav, I would kind of like mess up and pull the lead out and it's just like, ah, oh, I got to, give me two seconds, I got to solder this back in. There's all this clunkiness that comes with real analog gear. The sound is great, you know what I'm saying? But there is a clunk, so it's, a, it's, it's what you, you pick your poison. But you also, you also have to understand why people are saying analog sounds better. It's, it was just a lot more stages. So if I have a regular, let's say a Juno 106, right? We're recognizing that that Juno 106 is not at the proper level. So it's the first thing I do. I put it through a direct box because I'm gonna send it, you know what I mean? all around the room through cables to you. It looks like I'm just plugging into, I'm saying the listener or, or, or the artist, looks like I'm just plugging into a patch bay. But there's actually cables that go all through this room under the floor da, 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 to get to that. So we got to make sure that that signal is right and we're not getting radio noise and interference. So the first thing we do, we plug it into direct boxes. Then that goes into a board. What does that board have? On This is talking about the way in. So we got a preamp at the top. Then we got a whole section underneath that. We got EQs, we got sends. Even if they're not pressed in, the, the, it's going through those things, right? Mm -hmm. Then we're recording that to a whole different medium called tape, which has its own compression rate and its own factors and its own, like, how did you, you know what I mean? How did you, uh, like me, I used to record, it's, it's, I hate the fact that I could say this and some of y'all don't know what I'm talking about, but when, when you had to calibrate a room, you had to make a decision. It's like, okay, I'm using, uh, uh, the, the 456 tape, right? And I'm, I'm, I'm making it plus six. And then you had to say, is it plus six over 185 or plus six over 250? You had to know all this stuff. So then that's going to make a decision as to how hard I could hit the tape. I'm trying to show you all the processes that we go through. Now that Juno 106 sound has gone through all these processes, hit the tape. Then when I mix it, I'm playing it back through those heads. It's going back through another preamp, then coming back again. And I'm adding analog shit on top. That's why it sounds like that versus like, okay, I'm in a plugin and we're inside of a DAW. It's not going through all those stages. Yeah. So what we as engineers, when we first, when we first got into digital, it was like the CD was sold to us. And it was like, Hey, look at how clear the CD sound. When we had cassette tapes, it was like, yo, you have to worry about tape piss. I can only record these many generations on this tape or else it's going to keep going down. I'm going to have my version, my five dub down version of Nas's Illmatic was like, oh, the most bootleg cassette ever. You know what I'm saying? Like so much hits on it because it came from, I'm, I'm getting generation six. Hmm. You know what I'm saying? But of that tape, tape hits was a huge thing. So as us trying to make, bring it, that was the whole reason for the Dolby, um, um, like suppression stuff that would take the, the noise floor and, and, and all that hiss and bring it down, right? That was the whole point. When we got to CDs, we said, this is super clear. We got inside the computer. We said, this is perfect. It's clear. And us as engineers said, my ears are missing something. It's sterile. It doesn't sound the way everything sounded when I was going through analog gear. And we, we forgot that we were going through all of these stages of going into you. That's mm -hmm. the difference. So when you say the difference between analog and digital, you have to be really specific about what you're talking about. And you have to get to a point of like, okay, well then let me try to emulate that those stages 
inside of my dog hmm. if you don't have analog you know, and you to, that's what that's what why you see a proliferation of saturators and, yeah. and things like that and distortion and not not to distort like a rock guitar but the things that we learn about second and third order harmonics and what they mean and how they affect the sound and which ones are pleasing and which ones we don't want or sometimes like very practical if, if you were to have this 808 you know that's just super boomy and you were to take that 808 and then EQ it so that we only hear the harmonics of it, like double it, you know what I'm saying? And then you can add distortion and all that. You're gonna find that you're gonna hear your 808 better on a phone and on a laptop because you're tricking the ear into hearing the frequencies that are that can be produced through this. If you have a real, um, you know, 60, 60 hertz wave, that joint is like 20 feet. Like it's like 20 feet long, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's why theoretically that you can like, the car can pass you and after a certain point, you're only going to be hearing the bass because that wave is long enough to keep coming back to you. Mm -hmm. So there's no way that this can produce that wave. You, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> exactly. So there's no things that with, but you have to be mindful of where your consumer is listening. They're listening on laptops and this. Right. And so we have to have some things in there that are now like harmonically tricking them to say oh i get it that's where the 808 is i know this started off as like analog and digital but i'm giving mm -hmm. you all things to say now we have things that we're trying to emulate the things that we did like about analog and say right. Let's bring some of that warmth in then guess what analog's not dead mm -hmm. a tape machine didn't just automatically stop working because pro tools came out which means there are a lot of cheap tape machines out there. so you can go out and it doesn't have to be a 24 track Sony or a 24 track eight eight you know, look whatever it is right. you can go get a little two track joint run stuff through it and then run it back in and see what that sound like just there's all these little options and so analog gear is like it's just it's it's another salt or it's another just spice yeah. it's it, right. it, it's what you use it for you know what I mean so I don't have the digital versus analog but I dare you to try to do vocals the way I do it in an analog world you would literally you have to sit with a GML and do this. Right, do a whole bunch I'm of stuff. Moving. I'm moving. You know what I'm saying? That's that's yeah. one of the beauties of again of certain EQs where they have a follow feature now. So if you can figure out what that pinpoint frequency is when somebody's singing, the problem frequency doesn't just sit stagnant in one frequency; it moves. Yeah, All right. So now you can have the EQs that follow that. That you can you would literally be doing this on a physical EQ, trying to follow. You know what I mean? And mm. and now I have a graph where I'm looking at it, and and that. Those things are, are, it's just, it speeds up the work. Just, uh, there's, I can't say how good digital is for both. Like, it's incredible. Dope, dope. Yeah. Good question, Sasu. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yo, I want to go to another question. Let's get a uh, lens in here. Lens Leroy, go ahead and uh, unmute yourself. Hey, what's up, guys? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Sir. What's up? All right, cool. Hey, Guru, nice to meet you, brother. Thanks for taking your time out to talk to us. This, this, is, this is a blessing today. Um, I got a two part question. Um, when you, if you're recording a session, uh, what mic choice are you using in preamp um, and what interface are you using? Are you considering converters? Because, you know, every uh, interface is different. Uh, what is your go to? OK, so depending on what it is. Right. And and please don't get upset with me God, when I say this. So I went out and bought this Telefunken that the 421 and it's like ten fifteen thousand dollars. But you know what I mean? But it's it's the most incredible microphone that I've ever heard in my life um, before that. Uh, just historically, I was always like favoring Neumanns. You know, what I mean, it was a Neumann 87, 67 dude. You know, if you want to get the two um, preamp wise, I would constantly do that. Into for years and years and years and years, Jay's chain was just the 737. It was the 737 preamp and the compressor. Um, obviously, you know, I used to switch out sometimes and do the lead into the CL1B. Um, that's that's a favorite just chain that everybody uses. It's it's tried and true and it's proven. CL1B is a beast. Like sometimes, sometimes you see stuff that everybody uses it and it's a re it's really good. It's a reason why everybody uses it. You know what I mean? And I'm, yeah. I'm big on I'm big on like learn and use your own thing and don't just go after the name. But some names are there for a reason because they are just that good. You know what I mean? They're that good. They're gonna give you the sound. Mm -hmm. So again, uh, need 1073 or you know uh, there are some emulations of that that need 1073. I'm just naming that because of the flavor of it, right? Um, that that that's what the person is going after when they make these clones and things of that nature. And you got to test those out for yourself. But um, the 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 Neumann into the Avalon is perfect. Um, the ten I said the ten seventy three C O one B. Yeah. Uh, if you're going for darker sort of things or somebody's too bright, 
You know what I mean? Like sometimes using a C800 on certain things, as good as it is, is too bright sometimes for me. Yeah. Right. And I may I may run that into a darker preamp. So like the EMI preamps are a little darker. They're made to emulate Abbey Road boards. You know what I'm saying? So they're, they're a little darker than than your other preamps. So again, it's about choice and flavor. Um, mm-hmm. but that's that's mainly what I go for nowadays. Ruben, I've been recording into um my knee five hundred and going into uh the compressor that I'm using, which is real interesting, is there's a <laughs> There's a SSL 4000 stereo bus emulation made by Smart Labs, hmm. right? I love them. I love, I love, love. I think this this 500 series is better than the SSL um, center section, right? I love them. And because, again, because I didn't have all of my equipment in LA and it's like, okay, vocals now, I went into the left side of it and I was like, woo, this sounds really good on vocals. <laughs> and it's very, like, um, where you would normally on those, you know, there's very set, attacks and you only have like a couple of them in very set releases if you ever look at the center section of the 4000 but what the modification that they did is they gave you um first of all they got soft knee hard knee on there and for those that don't understand like that's when people see the knee thing it's just how the compression acts so it's like if you're sitting down i'm trying to do if this is my leg and this is this is my knee you know what i'm saying this is the rest of my leg that's hard knee it's like as soon as it comes in it hits soft knee is like as soon as it comes in, it gradually gets, you know what I'm saying? It takes a couple more seconds. That's what, that's all that means between hard knee and soft knee, right? Um, it has that on there. It also has this, this uh, thing that says T2. So it's taking the times and like halving them. So it's like in between, you, you'll be able to get the attacks and releases that are in between the numbers that are actually on this thing, right? So that's a huge thing for me too, is a lot of versatility. So that's another one that I just, I love, love, love that compressor. Um, it's just, it's, it's more, I see people just not using the tool right versus like having the wrong compressor. You see what I'm saying? Like you could give me just a basic, like say if you got, uh, say if I'm on the road and, and people would be surprised, they don't believe me. When I'm on the road with Jay-Z, there is no output. It is, it is my laptop and my Apollo. Mm-hmm. That's it. It that's it because I don't have time to be carting around. Stu does. Stu can have this incredible rig that he carts around because Stu's the engineer. Goo got to go DJ the show and record Jay and make my after party. Hmm. You know what I'm saying? So okay. when we're doing the Drake record that he's a feature on, it's like, yo, we just did a show. He has started writing the rhyme at like four in the afternoon, and it's like, oh, Goo, we got to go on stage and perform a show. We get back. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. To thing, he lays that verse. I send it off to 40. By this time, the internet in the venue, we're in, you know, West Bumblefuck, Germany somewhere, and I don't <laughs> know where we at. And it's just like, now the internet's gone. I got to tether my phone to be able to send the session to 40, and I barely made it to my after. I'm like walking in at 1.30 to the after party, like, to do my set. Yeah. I don't have time to be, it's, it's, it's close the laptop, grab the Apollo, out. Yeah. Wear it up. So the digital working in the box, yeah, it, was, yeah, it that actually was, works a lot faster. Yeah, that's that's the go-to. Yeah, and, and, and the UAD, he answered my question. The UAD, I think, is the best emulated uh, interface oh, that's out there because that's what I'm sticking up to doing right now because I love the analog. I got a couple of pieces, but they're not high-end. But I'll be comparing them. I just, I'm just stay with the plugins, man. It's just, now, it's just now, simple. Here's the thing. Here's mm-hmm. the thing. Now, now, the plugins work great. I love now. Mm-hmm. We get the UA stuff. It's like that 1073 is beautiful. The uh, mm-hmm. six ten is beautiful. Like all those emulations mm-hmm. are beautiful, um, and and being able to save, you know, your console. Like it's like I have mm-hmm. so many saved things, so that it's so quick. Yep. I have one that's just like, okay, I'm about to the do recall. Ruben Ru- yeah. Ru- vocals, Jay Z vocals, nonchalant vocals. You know what I'm saying? Raps. Mm-hmm. But like I'm just, I got all of those set, so it's just mm-hmm. like I know exactly what I'm doing really really quick. Um, mm-hmm. And then the way that that's first before the Pro Tools, so then all you got to do is go in your Pro Tools and on the bus thing, just hit default. And then now it's set up exactly the way, you know what I mean? Your console set up. Yeah. That part of it is incredible. Sweet, and, sweet. Yep. But I literally I literally just plug microphone into the back of my pocket. There you go. <laughs> Sounds great, man. Yeah. All right. Thanks again it, for the answer, man. Appreciate that. Good right. question, Lynn. <laughs> and that's a, a U87 y'all taking on the road? Uh, no, I, I do. I do take my telephone. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. You got your <laughs> telephone. <laughs> All right, let's make it. I said, I said, I, 
I'm, I'm sorry, it's the, it's the 251. Now I said a 420. It's the, it's the telephone okay. from 251. Right, 251. Yes, yes. All right. Cool, cool. Let's take one more question. Knowledge. Knowledge, you got a question? I see you got your hand raised. Shout out to the Wavy Seals Elite. Yo, man, if y'all want to get in here next time, we got legends like this in the in the building. You got to be a member of the Wavy Seals Elite to get this exclusive access. Let me say, let me say one more talk thing, Talk to too. Guru. Go ahead. Last question that we haven't talked about before. When you get into, like, you've already set up, you got your set up, you've been rocking for a minute, and you're like, oh, what do I add on next to upgrade my system? And nobody, okay. yes. nobody thinks about a clock. The clock getting an expensive, like if you was like, yo, I'm going to save my money to buy like a nice piece of gear, buy a clock first, mm. buy a well done clock. You will be so surprised at how much that as you add on other stuff, that clock is so important. Can it, you, it can really make the difference of like listening to your gear, not clock or working off its internal clock and then putting a real deal like I spent a thousand dollars on a clock. <laughs> it, yo, you'll be like night and day coming out the speed. Yeah. Like, the same equipment. It's just now all the ones and zeros are perfectly lined up. And it's not fighting to do that inside of the same system that's processing audio. When you got a dedicated clock, and it's like, I'm the leader of the band. Everybody march to my drum. It's, mm -hmm. It makes a huge difference. So it's something we don't, we always like, yo, should I buy more microphones? Should I buy more preamps? Should I buy more this? Then the clocks clock. first. Get the clock. Yo, so can yeah, you I just bought the Black quick. Line Audio one, and um, you're right. Because once yeah. I put that thing into the system, yes, uh, and I got the XB3 one, it's just, it's, yeah. it's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, so yeah, thanks for bringing that up to now. Maybe yeah. you heard that. Tell, yes, tell the group, the clock the, thing is crazy. The clock and again, I'm not that. saying, I'm not, everybody, everybody's at different stages in right. levels, yeah. yeah. Yep. When, you, when you first start now, you first walk in, I tell people this all the time. You only got a certain amount of money, right? The yeah. preamp is the most important thing. So if you can get that with UA or if you just find an outside preamp, you can get away with having a Rhodes microphone going into a really good preamp, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Versus like having, if you have the $10,000 microphone going into a shit preamp, it, you're just defeating the purpose. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You're totally defeating the purpose. But do, do the expensive preamp first, then go for the big microphone, then go for the clock. Mm -hmm. That's like in that order. Can you, uh, just for anybody out there that might not know what you mean by the clock, can you just uh, break that down for us real quick? Okay, all digital, all digital anything has has a clock in it. And by a clock, it means what are we working at? So when you say my session is at 44, you know, uh, uh, kilohertz, that means that we're taking a picture 44,000 times per second, right? And our sessions can be like 44, 48, 90. It's just really telling us how the fidelity how often am I taking a picture of this wave so that I can recreate it, right? When you have multiple pieces of digital gear, they all have to work in sync with each other. Mm -hmm. The clock is what we call the master. It's telling everyone, hey, you're supposed to be at this point at this time. And everyone is following that clock. So the clock becomes the master. Everything else becomes the slave. It is a dedicated way of making sure all the zeros and ones are hitting at the exact same time point there's a looseness that can happen when you don't have that or when you're clocking internally because like i explained stress going on that that one thing is running your computer is then running an operating system it's then running it's then trying to read audio files off of a disc and some and everybody doesn't have you know what i'm saying solid state drives to where it's like you may have the spinning disc and it could be jumping and, and if you haven't deep fragmented your disc this this Thing is jumping around to a whole bunch of different places on a disk trying to figure this out. Here's a whole bunch of other stuff the computer got to do. Then it's got to be running your plugins. Then it's got to be like, it's just so much for this one processor to do. And it's got a clock. So it's impossible for it to be as good of, as a, of, a, of a syncing source mm. as a dedicated clock. Also with dedicated clocks, you get a whole bunch of outputs in different formats of, of things that you want to do. You see what I'm saying? So like, say if a lot of people don't take advantage of it, but there's on, on your Apollo, um, just say interface, right? There, there is an ADAT pipeline in and out. Say you want to attach eight more tracks of something. You can, there's there's um, 500 series boxes now that you can get that have um, an optical on the back of it so that you can now in, go from inserting hardware into your DAW without having to do a whole bunch of extra patches. Just through putting this, this optical patch from the Apollo into this 500 box and then back out again. And then now in, in your in your session setup, you're gonna say, okay, well, this is this, this is this, this is this, this is this, and start pulling them up inside of Pro Tools, hmm. all through a digital domain. But but 
who's clocking in that point is the, is the thing. So there has to be some sort of A to D and D to A conversion. You know what I'm saying? There has to be, and that takes a certain amount of time. So even though it's fast, we, we, if we have a clock, that clock is telling us exactly where to be. And that's why it sounds so much better when, when everything is clocked together. It's a syncing shit. Dope, man. Thank you for breaking that down. Yo, I'm going to bring uh, knowledge in here. We got, we're going to make this the last question for the Wavy Seals Elite. Uh, knowledge, go ahead and unmute yourself and, uh, and hit Guru with your question. Yo, peace, God. What up? Um, you got? My question is, and it's to me it's kind of remedial, but we don't talk about it much. And I just want to get your take of philosophy on it. When you're doing your first mix, mm -hmm. where do you aim to have your vocals in the in the level of everything? Uh, if you're saying like a number, um, I don't know if there's a number. I, I would say roughly like minus. Well, or something like that. If there's no number, I, I try to match it to wherever like my snare is at. And if there's no snare, then it's like I'm kind of used to where I think the vocal should sit in the beat. But that that's that's style dependent too as well. But all all I would say the right answer is that the vocal is clear. The vocal got to be clear, unless you're in some sort of genre where it's that's the aesthetic of it, right? Where it's, the aesthetic is to not be clear. But I I want the vocal clear. I want the vocal. I like vocals that don't sit so far over the beat that they overpower the beat. Like the beat, your beat can sound whack because your vocals are too loud. You see what I'm saying? So I like to I like to have it to right where I can hear the vocals clearly. But then Dr. Dre also gave me another tip like recently where he was like he will on purpose if he got to that sweet spot he will on purpose like go up an extra decibel or two because once it's mastered and I'm adding bass in it'll take away, it'll make the vocals seem lower if I'm if I'm adding bass and matching. So normally I, I'll start a mix and I'll have my drums knocking around like minus three. You know what I'm saying? That gives me enough headroom that like once I do what I do on the master bus that I'm not, you know what I mean, killing anything. Then I, I normally start all the time with like the music. Even, even if I start with vocals and like clean the vocals up, I'm not setting the vocal level yet, right? And, and some of that also too depends on the style of the beat. So I like to set vocals when I have all of my like high end percussion stuff in because that's gonna make a big difference. Dope. You know what I mean? So the way the if the hi-hat's going if you know, and you got all this other stuff going on, that makes a difference if if where where your vocal is gonna sit because you have a lot of high end content and energy and information. So, you know, but most of the time I like to base it off of like it's tucked in like right with the snare. Sometimes the snare wins out, sometimes the vocal wins, but it's right around that same like area of sonically for me of where the snare is. Okay. Yeah, that's about where I've been taught to keep the vocals close to the snare. If you can hear the snare in the vocals, you usually do it. Yeah, and, 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 and again, it depends on what the program material is. Sometimes you have really dense middles, you know what I'm saying? And I gotta like make a decision on, maybe I'll widen the vocal a little bit so that it's just like, okay, it's not fighting so much for this middle space or I'll make a decision that I like the vocal like that and I'll dip something in the middle. And then mm. most of the time when I dip in the middle, I kind of increase that thing on the side so that your ears don't think like you're losing that particular frequency. Mm. But I just, I just, everything is about making space and carving space. And that's the biggest part of like, once you carve the space out, the vocal has a place to sit. And that's the, you know, that's, that's, that's mixing. Mixing is carving those spaces and making the decisions as who sits where and who wins out. That's that's all it is. Dope. Good question, knowledge. Thank you. Um, and when you say uh, widening the uh, vocal, sometimes like what kind of processes are you using to do that? Basic stuff. The, uh, the uh, what is that? The PS, like PS twenty two, uh, like all those PS um, things that we've got. Mm -hmm. um, like a uh, chorus effect doublers type stuff or. Well, a chorus effect or a doubler to me, to me necessarily, is a very specific thing, okay. right? That has a flavor. And yes, I do use chorus effects and doublers. Um, I'm trying to think of like just any of your favorite plugins or that are that are chorus effects doublers. Or um, uh, I use a lot of the um, the uh, uh, Fab Filter stuff in terms of harmonically trying to add stuff to it. But widening is, is mainly like my waves. Okay. Stuff that, what is it, the PS22 or the whatever. I got I lazy on memorizing I, stuff now. <laughs> the search, the you search just go to it, like, yeah. 
I'm never going down the list. I just put PS and then it, and it like sort of pops. So it's like PS22 or something like that. Uh, but it's, it, 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 it's very specific as to like how far you can take a mono signal. Like you mm. can go really far. You can do, and you can do things where like the bottom bass part can be in the middle and then you can spread out a little mm. bit as you go up the frequency. You know what I'm saying? Because a lot of times if you're dealing with like really low content, we still want that in the middle. And yeah. then you want the upper, as we go up, it kind of spreads out a little bit. Okay, I'm gonna definitely look into that. Yo, so Guru, before we get out of here, I want to hit you with like a, a lightning round of questions, man. I got, I know you could talk about this stuff all day. Oh, <laughs> You're an excellent I'll teacher, man. Yeah. <laughs> You're an excellent teacher. But for these next, I got three questions that I'm just like fire them off, fire it, quick answers. So, um, one of them: What three plugins do you use in every session? Give me three plugins that's in every session. Uh, Pro Q three. Um, SSL center section, um, probably the SSL uh, 4000G. Okay. Um, and, and I swap between the wave one and the plug in the lines. Definitely heavy on the SSL stuff. Um, okay. That's a dope answer there. One, uh, next question I got is what is your favorite pastime outside of music? Uh, favorite pastime outside of music, pipe photography. Yeah, I see you. I see you getting busy uh, in photography. I ain't had time to touch on that, but I, I see that you are also a, you know, pretty dope a guru in photography too. Um, um, last thing I want to ask you today is like, what's like the best piece of adv advice that you've ever received that you feel like you want to impart on people today, like young engineers and kind of coming up after you? Do it now. Don't wait. There's no, there's no, like, uh, you know, people teach you that, like, oh, I'm, I'm learning this, and then once I get done with the school, I'm gonna graduate and then start my real life. But no, do it now. Mm. Do it now. Mess up. You know what I mean? Get better. Like, don't wait. Don't wait. What are you waiting for? Like, I wish I would have just like started, you know, engineering when, when, when I was a kid. You know, like, why wait? Just, just do it now. Do everything you want to do right now. And, and there's no better time than right now because we have the ability to do whatever we want, you know, just do it now. Do it now. Yo, wise words from a wise man. Like I started off saying, Guru, uh, I'm a, a huge fan of your work. I'm super motivated by the chance to be able to talk to you today. So thank you for coming through, spending some time, sharing your wisdom. Uh, we, your gotta get into, uh, we gotta we got to set up a time, man, where I can just break down a session and just do a walkthrough of mixes and um, just for sure. all those cool things. Oh, that was another thing. Yeah. Um, there's no that now, and when we talk about now in today's world, we say what's something that's on every mix. I have really, 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 really gotten big on multi-band compression on vocals. Okay. So, so I'm I'm most of the time using um, the MC four hundred four. Oh like, man! Yeah. yeah, it's just the <laughs> that's the that's my baby right there. That's on every track I use. So now I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> just the, it's just the one that I know the best. But I'm saying any multi-band compressor would do. But just the ability, number one, for that low, low end to be able to control plosives, because I was the guy that would go in and I'll click game all the every time like yeah. that air hits the microphone and it does that pop thing. I'll go in and just highlight click game, click game, click game. But even then, still, you don't want to make the person sound like they have a lisp. You know what I'm saying? So there has yeah. to be some of that. And the way you want to control it is just being able to like really compress just those low frequencies will take out all those plosives without making it so low that it's lispy. You know what I mean? Sort mm -hmm. of thing. And then being able to like, being able to control like that high, uh, the, like the high mid frequency and, and the compression on that is it, priceless, man. Priceless. So <laughs> I would definitely say multi-band compression on vocals um, is a huge thing for me now. And that's something I didn't do before that I just, I can't live without no more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, multi-band compression is definitely heat, man. But yes, we're gonna set up a a time for us to get back together and and go through a session and get a more technical breakdown of actually your session workflow. Um, that's gonna be exclusive to the Wavy Seals Elite, though, man. I can't bring that to YouTube. I gotta save some <laughs> stuff for my gang, you know. Uh, but y'all still got chances to sign up now before the next time that I link up with Guru and uh, he walks us through one of his sessions. So make sure y'all. Go to my website, uh, courses.wavywayne.com right now so that you can sign up for the Wavy Seals Elite and that you don't miss that. So, um, and, and let me say this, let me say this too while we're on here, man. Like, please. signing up for that package is something that is, is more of 
learning things in a school environment and learning things that you would not know. Like, let me let me explain something to you that that I had to learn, right? Um, little simple things like watching a video of you talking about pre and post on the master fader and the regular other faders is like something that I would never like teach in my class. And I was like, you know what? I've never taught this and my students need to know this. That's a great point of like, learning that if I just have the, if I have all my tracks just going to one and two and that master fader comes down, it's like, okay, as I get lower, it's not compressing as hard, so it's gonna affect it the lower I pull this because it's post. Yeah. And it's like, I, I know that, but I've never explained that to my students. So I said to say, I not only watched your videos, but I also learned things, but I'm also learning things that I need to teach my own students. Mm. So I would recommend that anybody that gets in there, besides just learning quick keys and learning, you know, um, you know, how to how to maneuver around Pro Tools. There's, there's concepts that are being taught there as to why you do certain things. And I think that's what makes it so dope. So everybody make sure you sign up. Yo, and, yo, I, I appreciate you saying that because you definitely brought me to the point of the, one of the main reasons why I wanted to uh, start the Wavy Seals Elite is because of, we are in the information age, right? And there, of course, I got many YouTube videos online and you can go read any book you want to and watch a video about mixing. But without the guide, without somebody to structure you, hey, okay, you got all these different pieces of information, but this is how they line up and this is why they line up and this is how you should organize them for the best possible outcome. Without having a guide, you still out here fishing in the dark, you know? Um, so um, you know, I, I, I think you, you see it. You, you have to also realize, guys, that like, sometimes you gotta realize which tool to, to, to choose. And I think that's also what you get. It's like somebody saying to you, yo, is a Ferrari a great car? And you're like, yeah. But it's like, it's not a great car to move a house. And when and when the task is moving a house, you want a truck. And when mm. the task is going fast, you want a Ferrari. You need to know, just because something is expensive and total is the nicest thing, you need to know when that is, you know, when to apply that. No one tries to move a house with a Ferrari and it doesn't matter that it's this incredible car. You gotta know how and when to apply these different things. And people will try to sell you on, oh, it's expensive, so it must be good. And it's like, bro, it don't apply to this situation. That's the other things you'll learn. <laughs> word up man so make sure y'all tap in join the network join the community learn from audio engineers that's been doing this in the game and also you can build up like guru was saying a lot of his opportunities came from networking and he grew up with these people like they, they came up together it wasn't just trying to latch on to somebody that's already you know got something big and moving it's you coming up with the people next to you and creating a crew so that y'all all looking out for each other so um man this has been a, a wealth of knowledge I'm, i can't wait to watch this back and, and take a whole bunch of notes myself man i've been over here i've been taking notes the whole time yo don't get it don't get it confused i hope y'all have been too yo um yo guru hats off to you i don't even know what else to say man this a, you a legend salute, this was legendary man salute, salute. yo thanks everybody for watching we out of here thanks yes indeed thanks wavy man